Hi, this is Alex Lindsay sitting in for Leo Laporte. I'm here with Greg Farrow and Justine Ezrick, and we're going to be talking about how do we fix California's housing crisis? Should the FBI track our faces and who's signing up for Apple TV Plus? Coming up next on This Week in Tech. Podcasts you love. From people you trust. This, this is Twit. This is Twit, episode 744 for November 10th, 2019, Boiling the Privacy Frog. This Week in Tech is brought to you by ZipRecruiter. Hiring isn't easy, but there's one place you can go where hiring is simple and smart. That place is ZipRecruiter, where growing businesses connect to qualified candidates. Try it free at ZipRecruiter.com slash Twit. And by Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage. If you're thinking about moving your data storage to the cloud, you need to know about Wasabi Enterprise Class Cloud Storage at one-fifth the price of Amazon S3 and up to six times faster with no hidden fees for egress or API requests. Calculate your savings and try Wasabi with free unlimited storage for a month at wasabi.com. Code TWIT. And by Capterra. Find the right tools to make an informed software decision for your business. Visit Capterra's free website at capterra.com slash twit. And by Mint Mobile. Mint Mobile provides the same premium network coverage you're used to, but at a fraction of the cost because everything is online. Mint Mobile makes it easy to cut your wireless bill down to just $15 a month with their three-month introductory plan. And get the plan shipped to your door for free at mintmobile.com. Dot com slash twit. Hi, everyone. Welcome to This Week in Tech. This is Alex Lindsay, and I am sitting in, obviously, for uh, Leo, who is still out and enjoying some part of the world. And I'm uh, joined here with uh, for, with Greg Farrow. Hi, Greg. Hey, how are you doing? I'm doing well. I'm and back also, in studio this time, too. I am. It's crazy. You're it's in studio. I'm in studio. Unfortunately... Justine Ezrick is not in studio, but, but, but not, fortunately she's here. I'm in Los Angeles, but I'm here virtually. And you were you were just up here, weren't you? I was. Yeah, I was in Cupertino for the Final Cut Summit, so that was so really sad. fun. It's so sad you didn't you weren't able to make it here. Mm. I know. I just thought about. It. I was like, man, I should have stayed a couple extra days. Yes, mm. yes. So, so, but we've got uh, we've got lots of news um, uh, and uh, lots to talk about. So we'll just jump right back into it. Now, this is something that is a little bit California-centric, but it is affecting a lot of places around the world. Uh, you know, one of, the, one of the articles here from New York Times is why $4.5 billion from big tech won't end the California housing crisis. Now, housing is becoming, in urban areas, is becoming almost uh, unworkable. Um, what is the, I guess the, the real question here um, is, you know, what can we do, Greg, about, uh, <laughs> what can we do? This is all up to you. Yeah, it's, uh, yeah. You know, what can we do about the housing crisis from a tech perspective? Um, I think that these tech companies that talk about doing remote working should actually just do that. Why would you put houses here at all? I don't, I think if the, in any realistic world, Silicon Valley is an improbably bad place to do business. It's prone to fires. You've got structural challenges around electricity. It's an earthquake zone. And the cost of buying up land and the government resistance, like the, the bureaucratic process, which can either be hijacked by people, by the community, or by the government themselves, means that um, I don't think there's any answers here about what we're doing um, and what, um, you know, like, why would you do business here at all? I'm a bit baffled by that at all. Why, I, I can't understand why you would even build another house here. Why not just go somewhere else and set up an office in London? Here's the here's New the problem. York. I mean, here's here here's the issue that a lot of folks will will, will bring up yep. in this in this situation is, uh, number one is for if you're not at a headquarters, a lot of times it's seen if you have an um, if you want to move up in a corporation, it's hard to do that mm. from a satellite office, and so yep. a lot of folks aspire to uh, moving from you know get to the headquarter office because that's where you're going to be running and uh, running into the, the right people quote unquote yep. that are going to help kind of uh, move you forward also in the competition for programmers and staff and and so on and so forth there becomes this issue of can you find people that want to live in kansas 
You know, well, now, I, and, and, and I think that, that that argument is slowly sliding with this expense. I think that, that the, the argument is starting to slide against there's a lot of people that would love to move to Cam Kansas um, yeah. because they're Increasing tired so. of spending so much well, and I, dealing with the There's a couple of things there. I think so one so is um, that attitude of you have to be in head office to get ahead is right. an old attitude. It's not something that's true anymore. There's certainly a lot of organizations for whom... Um, well, it's they, pretty accepted in, 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 at a lot of these. I mean, the, it's not so much whether it's true or not. It's whether yes. people think it's true. Exactly. And, and, and increasingly what we're seeing is there's a turn away from that. So if you're still mm -hmm. working for a traditional organization with traditional managers, with traditional mm -hmm. approaches and little... But I'm talking about like, yeah. those are sensitivities at like, in information companies. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> it's, not, yeah, yeah. it's not like it's not like we're not talking about yeah, like a steel company. Brands I mean, are still run like that, but increasingly yeah. that's no longer true. I mean, one of the interesting things about this is that the change around uh, the immigration policy in the US has actually seen a substantial rise in remote working. Mm -hmm. And this idea of we used to bring all of the people in from all around the world, from India, from Europe, you know, from Asia, and they would all come here and get visas and work here for two years. Right. And as the immigration policies change, a lot of these companies have actually just picked up all the divisions that used to be based here and sent them back to other countries. So they're now basing them in, in those right. countries. And if, you know, somebody from India needs to move to somewhere in Asia to get that team together, that's what they're doing. Right? Ju Justine, what are, you, what, are, what are your opinions on, on this? I mean, I love working remotely. Everyone that I work with, we all work, you know, from wherever. Right. I mean, I'm basically, I work just, you know, all around the world constantly, but I think there is nothing that can replace, you know, passing off a hard drive to somebody and knowing that that's actually going to get there. You're not going to have to wait for download speeds. So I think, you know, being in the office is, is such a huge, I think, advantage, like you were talking about, because you actually see the people, you meet with the people and you are face to face with them. And me as someone who is so into tech and loves it so much, there's really nothing different than just, you know, actually being with a person and having those conversations. Cause that's when a lot of things do happen when you can actually sit down and look at somebody, because even though we're doing this, it's virtual, it's great. But I think sometimes you really do have to be in the room with somebody to really get a feel yeah, for a see. person and to get the vibe. So that's what you're losing. Well, and and, and I admit, I, I thought about this looking at this article. I was last week, I was in the East coast and I had a bunch of meetings and then they're just discussions, mm -hmm. just talking to folks but I did it in person, you know, like, and it was, yeah, yeah. you know, and I went from Boston to New York to, to DC because there was a, a need to at least have that first conversation, um, you know, in person with them while you're, and yeah. a lot of times you're talking to a handful of people mm -hmm. and it's just, and I think part of the problem also is, is that some of our virtual conferencing, as we talked about before the show, is this can be a little rocky. Yeah. Um, and, and so, and don't, so there's don't this. Use, don't use those comments. I, I, I agree with you. There's certainly value in face-to-face -face time and there's a very, mm -hmm powerful, high, high density, information rich conversation that happens when you're mm -hmm. face to face, right? right? And it can be very valuable. And it's also very useful to establish a baseline relationship between two people, a professional relationship. It happens very quickly, if mm -hmm. that makes sense. Yep. The challenge after that is when you start getting people working in four or five time zones. So our business runs and we have people in Australia, uh, east and west coast of the US. Mm -hmm. We've got some in Europe and a lot of us are moving around all the time. And what we've now found is it's much easier to talk asynchronously once mm -hmm. you get practiced at it, and this is the challenge, if you spend all your life face-to-facing people and going eyeball to eyeball with a high density conversation, you get comfortable with that mode of communication. Does mm -hmm. that make sense? Mm -hmm. And if you go to sure. remote working, then you have to change your habits. You have to change. Um, the metaphor I've sometimes used for it, do you remember reading books and then you started reading from the screen? Do you actually read a book now at all? I didn't before. Yeah. Sorry. So, I, I, I've been listening to books since the late eighties on, <laughs> it started on tapes and everything else. I, I don't, I don't, yeah. I, the idea of like okay. sitting down and actually so reading maybe the a book metaphor and mono, apply mono like, about like you, Justine? Idea. Does the metaphor apply to you? Do you still read books or you do everything on eBooks? It's all, I mean, I listen to a lot of audiobooks as yeah. well. I mean, it's, it's just like I can be doing something else and yeah. also listening. So, you know, driving or traveling, it's like I can be listening. So I could be, let me you ask know, you, how long did it take you of listening to audio books before you started to absorb that correctly. The first time you listened to an audio book, you would have had struggled to listen. Now I listen. Well, for me, yeah. it's mostly how long, how long did it take me to get to two X? Yes. You know, in my listening speed. Oh yeah, that's speed. a great point. Yeah. yeah. Well, I mean, you know, even for me, I'm more of like a, I, I mean, I'm also a visual learner, but I feel like for me, I retain things much better just listening to it. So mm -hmm. even if I'm trying to memorize something, like I can't look at it, I have to like hear it. Yes. So I think a lot of people, again, going back to this, a lot of people learn different. So there's so many 
aspects of personalities that also mm-hmm. kind of play into this. Whereas I would work much better in a situation that I'm in now. If you give me my tasks, I will go off by myself and get them done. But mm-hmm. some people can't work that way. So I think it's kind of tailoring to the way that people learn and the way that people work is one of the most important things I think that, you know, when it comes to like hiring is like, how does this person work best? What can I do to help this person perform the best work possible? And I, I do also think our current workspaces are very much targeted at extroverts. So they say something like 70 to 80% of the population is extroverts and they are people who thrive on face-to-face communications, thrive on a room full of people. But the people who actually uh, do get the job done is the introverts. They're the people who'll go off and sit in a room quietly and just grind away at the task and bring it back completed. And remote work works very well for them. And it's going to be a challenge for the extroverts to change their mode of, you know, this face-to-face, drawing energy from a room, standing around a desk. Well, but I think that it's also, I mean, I think that, that one of the one of the challenges um, that was brought up in the chat room mm. is uh, that our video conferencing software still stinks. Mm. You know, so, you know, like, and, and you know, for me, you know, I taught, I was teaching classes in, in Rwanda yeah. at a school that I built there. And, and um, the, uh, so we're teaching classes and I couldn't be down there and I got frustrated. So I ended mm. up building a bunch of hardware yeah, that yeah, makes that yeah. makes that go away mm-hmm. um, and makes it much, much smoother, but that's still, you know, tens of thousands of dollars of hardware that, that all makes that work. Yeah. You know, it's not something that you can just put into it, every it is, office. It's, it is su- the it's most, better than a classroom, but it's not. You're hitting not on a same. real sore point, that, which is why is our conferencing software so abysmally awful? Oh, I can tell you. Yeah. Can I tell you? Oh, go ahead. Go let's, ahead. Let's, let's I have an opinion. Go. I have an opinion here. It's, it's because we want to make it easy. Yeah. So, like, the thing is, is that we want to make it cheap and easy. Like, that yeah. is this, the, and, and this is the problem with content in general, but yeah. it is, like, let's make it easy for everybody to do it. And the problem is, is that when you, as you drive down that ease of use, it you, drives you to limit, bad. Yeah. you keep on limiting what you can actually get mm-hmm. done. And as you make it something that can just go everywhere, then it, it you know, um, then it the problem you yeah. end up with is that now it can't do anything because it had to work on every platform and it had to work on, you know, the reason mine worked was because it was really hard, you know, like it was really hard to make it, you know, and, and it was really, but when you're actually using it, it's super easy, but yeah. building it, it was expensive. I'm having really good luck at the, the moment with Zoom. We've, we've mm-hmm. left Skype behind years ago. Mm-hmm. WebEx is a crime against humanity. Microsoft Teams is a, is a load of something. And we're finding Zoom not bad. I wouldn't say it's good, well, but it's- stable. It mostly stable and mostly works. Mostly. I think there's a, the biggest thing I found about uh, Zoom is it has this habit of defaulting to the bad microphone and the bad video camera. And when you put a decent camera on top and a decent microphone, it's excellent, actually. Yeah, there, we built some overrides for Hangouts mm. that made it much better. You yeah. know, like basically there was there used to be an API for Hangouts uh-huh. and so we built uh-huh. it in where we could do what we call soft selecting, yep. uh, which let us basically ignore certain people if we needed to. Could you um, build us a, a, a camera lock for Zoom, please? Because the the one thing I, I dislike about Zoom is there is its automatic switching. Yep. It, uh, it makes conversation very uh, jittery. Yeah. Very yeah, the, much like, I don't remember. Now this the, person is talking. Now this person is talking. Now this person is talking. I don't remember whether it was, what it was. I don't remember what the official external name was, but there was a thing on pinning or make sticky. Yeah, <laughs> That's okay. what we used to call it uh, for Hangouts, where you could just click on right. on, on yeah. someone's screen and it would hang. It would at least hang on that for the broadcast. It still did a free run, but any a user could also just click on it yeah. and only see those things. Now, but those tools. What, are, but there's, but again, your point is is that Zoom's not suitable. Is suitable for a small group of people, five to right. ten people getting together. Right. Works pretty well for that. We use it for right. live streaming to YouTube a couple of times, and it kind of works okay. Right. Within, but it still it still gets into yeah. that dumbed down to a point where it's compared yeah, to think, what it could be. Is I think Zoom is even. I mean, I I really like it, but mm. it's. I would say it's even more dumbed down than Skype. I think it's. I mean, no, it's no, so it's funny. Hard to, These things are hard to dumbed do. down, but yet I am a very tech savvy person. I'll build you a computer, but I sometimes can't get Skype to work. Like, no, that's <laughs> the, no yeah. sense at all. Yes. That's not you. Yes. That's Skype. Well, don't bl- that's, don't blame yourself. That's blame Microsoft. It's been yeah. dumbed down. Seriously, though. that's because you don't have. What if something goes wrong? You don't have options to fix it. Yes. Like yeah, there's, like there are many problems we have with Skype that we server, used to be able to I'll send you guys a link. Well, and, and then the problem <laughs> you get into is, is the latency, right? Like the, it's all this low latency, you know, why we, um, hmm. I mean, the best solutions that we've seen have been private solutions, as you, as you, as you said, which are people building on top of WebRTC. And, and that is, yeah. you know, so people will build a custom solution for letting people do it within a company or for broadcasters. And mm. they're sitting on top of WebRTC and that has been super successful for a lot of them. Yeah. Um, but that's not something that right now it, is a is a scalable 
It's not what everybody's yeah, doing. I think there's, there's a couple of other things too. One of the things that we find is we get people come on our shows and they'll use the rubbish camera that comes inside of their Dell, oh. you know, the five cent camera that came out of the factory. Yep. And then they'll yell at the screen and there's a microphone underneath the keyboard and expect that to work correctly. Right. But they won't I consider... I've the, the, eyes, or the, uh, like the eyesight camera on the iMac right now. I mean, it's definitely not the best, but yep. as long as you mm -hmm. have like decent lighting, you can still this get... Is, this is where I was just going to say straight after that is why are not people taking responsibility for themselves and thinking I've got to have a space in my study which has got a background that's pretty. Like this is just a background behind me, right? And there's some nice lights here. Mm -hmm. You know, my home studio, which you've seen a couple of times when I've been fortunate to be on the show before, all I've got is a couple of lights that shine on my face right? and, and, a, and a, a bit of a backdrop there that doesn't look like I've just, you know. Right. I mean, we had a kit. Uh, I don't know how we got into this from cities, but we'll keep it. <laughs> yeah, the whole, the whole um, so the whole anyway, but crisis. we had a uh, uh, we had used to have a kit because we did about twelve hundred hangouts for Google, mm -hmm. and and um, we did we had this kit that we would send out um, that was just an IFB and it was mm -hmm. an Ego Light. You know, there's a yeah, yeah, little, little Ego Light, yep. an Ego Light with a C uh, Logitech C nine twenty, yep, um, and a little tripod for it, yep. and a little tripod for this, and that was it. And, and the thing is, is it was literally tripled the quality of, yes. of the person's, you know, look. And, yeah. and it was just like, and we sent it to him with a return address and a little video on how to put it together. I agree. And, this is what we it, it, it just worked. We're you know? doing that. I, I just did that. I did some live, I did some video for a client recently, same sort of thing. Made them go out and buy a Logitech C922. Yeah. Uh, made them buy a decent $50 microphone. Right. Right. And boom, everything was, and then taught them how to put the lights in front of their face instead of behind their heads. And it was fine. It's crazy. Right? Crazy stuff. Or not right over but, I mean, top that's, of their head. But that's a learned experience. People who work from home have to learn that. Mm -hmm. And the people aren't used to thinking for themselves. They're used to going into an office where that's done for them. So well, and, not, and, and usually not done for them very well. I mean, mm -hmm. the the, the yeah. IT team is usually available, uh, is usually the ones managing that. And they're not, I mean, I don't, not, no mm -hmm. offense to the IT teams, but they're not camera people. And so the, it's kind of a goofy little process. Well, now, Justine, I got a question for you. Um, so is there a way, these, these you know, Apple and all these folks are spending billions of dollars on on cities um uh, what sh what could they be doing with that money that would actually make a difference as opposed to just building more of the same do you have any, I any mean, thoughts there? for me just even in my neighborhood i've moved to la like in 2007 and just seeing the changes in like the homeless population just increase where i'm afraid to even walk my dog now like in my own neighborhood and right. you know it's hard because it's like i'm completely sympathetic for this because i know these people are in mm. terrible places to be in this situation but it's like how do I feel safe in my own town? And, you know, I think a lot of it, unfortunately, comes down to mental health. So it's like, how is that something that needs to be taken to a place? And a lot of these people don't want to go to the shelters because they are not able to either they have to be clean or they're unsafe. So they can't take their families there. So there's I, I mean, I don't have an answer, but it's just I just wish that there was something that you know, we could do to just further that because they do need help, but there's not really a place for them to go. If only tech companies paid taxes, we'd have mental health. So I agree with you, Justine. I think the other thing that's happening here is this 4.5 billion they're giving that is not a gift. It's They're trying to make it into a virtual signal and say like, we're, we're but what they're actually doing is investing it in a fund and they're trying to make money out of it. So they're not actually giving it or anything. All they're doing is putting $4.5 billion into an investment fund that will build properties that they will take profits from in a few years' time. So it's yeah, not a, it's even like... It's not, not even, even a like gift. Know, it's not even uh, helping. Like it's making it worse, right? Yeah, like Google, I think, I'm not sure 100% of, for, but this is what I've heard, like, as far as, um, like, in Playa Vista, like, you know, they've bought up a bunch of properties there. So it's like the housing market in Playa Vista in Los Angeles has just, like, you know, quadrupled over the past year because Google put their offices in and now they own a bunch of those properties. So even that for just people who were looking at buying just a home for their families, it's, it's, you know, it's unattainable at this point. Yeah. Yeah. And I think that, and, and I think that there is, I, I don't, I'm not clear mm. that the current cities can be fixed. We talked about this on Mac break last week. I, yeah. I don't think that, I think that there is a argument that it's not changing the city. It's not that these cities will go away. San Francisco is not going to go anywhere. LA is not going to go anywhere. But I think that if we think about reorganizing for the population growth that we have, you know, the projected population growth that we're probably going to have, continuing to grow cities the way that they're being grown, mm. where they're largely subservient to cars, where they're largely, you know, yeah. uh, oh, yeah, single yeah. family houses or, or all that silliness, um, is that's not sustainable and it's not scalable. Yeah, well, you know, and, and I think that there's, you know, I think, and, and I think that a lot of the tech companies are thinking about this. I think that this is, we're starting to see this. I mean, I'm wondering when, 
um, you know, a company like Amazon decides to do city as a service. Well, the, the challenge <laughs> here is that I see this as $4.5 billion that they should have paid in taxes. And then the government would have it and then it would be able to say... the government would do that so well, wouldn't it? it generally, it does it I'm better, sorry, right? Yeah, because it doesn't have a... Really? Prof yeah, it gets a 25% edge because it doesn't have to do it profitably, it, it, right? Well, it, uh, it's an have interesting you, have you thing. Hang on, hang on. Jobs? I've worked on plenty of... <laughs> I mean, just, I, have you ever worked? Get, have you ever worked for a big company? Yeah, I have. those people are incompetent. Well, I mean, governments have their problems, oh but gosh. I tell you what, your average big corporation is a bunch of idiots in suits, oh. as opposed to idiots in cheap clothing. That's the only difference between a government and a corporation. And a government doesn't have to make a profit; they can make one twenty percent of mistakes and bad decisions and still be on target. But that would be assuming it was twenty percent. It generally the is. The only problem here. <laughs> so, you know, we, we, we shouldn't deviate houses. on a tech show into the modes of government. Well, government, perhaps, government but I, that's where I stand. Houses. I mean, there there are many things that the government could do with with that with that money. They could they could improve mental health, yeah. but the one thing they they absolutely could not do is build houses. Government all government does in the way of housing is say if you can build a house. No, and no. What they were actually doing in the original plans for this particular estate, one of the ones that's got $2 billion worth of funding, 50% of it was designated as low-cost housing and the developer would have to give it away at below cost. But they could make it up in the other part, right? But now that the big companies are throwing in $4.5 billion, they're going to get the planning rights to it. They'll change it all to high-end housing and there'll be nothing left at the low end. And that's the problem because the government doesn't have a profit motive. It was going to be able to do it for the good of everybody. This investment, which must produce a return to Apple and Google and whoever's putting the money into it, must be high-end housing and it's going to displace people and it's going to make the problem worse. We'll see. However, I definitely it will, don't I mean, disagree so with it. It will, it will at least... Worse. It will at least... Uh, do a little of what uh, Mr. Lindsay wants to happen and uh, transform the city into more of a into more dense densely populated place. The, the plans that Google has for San Jose, the uh, the housing that Facebook is building. Um, I don't know. Uh, Apple hasn't shared their their plans for what they want to do, but they're trying to at least build housing near where they are. Well, and I think that so that the people uh, in suburbs don't have to don't have to deal with then their housing does not uh, get taken over by Google. I think that, that well, that, now is this housing though? Is this specific to employees of these companies? So like, it like is you're an not. Employee? It is for Facebook. Okay. It is for Google. It is partially, yeah. but not entirely. Good old Facebook lining their pockets again. No, no questions. Well, face, well what Facebook is basically doing is building dorms. Yeah. They're building. They're trying to build. They're doing yeah. the, the because uh, Facebook doesn't want anybody not the, inside of the camp, the, inside of the uh, kindergarten. Kissimmee. Florida. Anybody goes to work for Facebook, well, it's like a kindergarten, and all the little nerds get inside there, inside the well, little I bubble. That, but again, I think that I think that there is you know. a there is a argument for these companies, and I think they're trying. I think that a lot of them are trying to figure it out to mm -hmm. get out of the urban areas and to you know build large urban structures that are not you know inside yeah. of these and it's not called taxes. If you well, paid your taxes, if, if, the government if would have the less, money to build these infrastructures. If there are less really you, even Facebook if you put in employees a, a, on the roads, then then yeah. I'm happier. If there are, if the Facebook people just have to walk to work, that's that's mm. a that's a that's solving several problems. I, regardless of whether we think what 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 people should do or shouldn't do, mm. uh, you know the reality is is that at some point I think that a lot of the pressure for on San Jose and mm. San Francisco and so on and so forth is going to go down. And the reason it's going to go down is because these companies. So here's are my favorite out, question. But, to here, but here's here's what these companies are going to do. Yep. They're going to figure out how to move to Kansas, and they're going to build big. They're going to buy hundreds of hundreds or thousands of acres, and they're going to and, and they're going to build it. Now you're talking about a testing, science, science fiction it. dystopia. No, they're, they're testing That's exactly it in, in what Toronto they talk about. Right in, now. They yeah. are testing it in Toronto right now. They're, yeah. they're, Google is building its own its this, own neighborhood, at least. This is them quietly trying to figure this out because mm -hmm. for them, it it's not so much a uh, making profit off of other people renting that space. It is a it is a function of lowering their overall cost because the the premium that they pay to bring people into this into the state at this yep. point is so high mm -hmm. that it would be much better for them to to be able to, um, you know, have a lot more. And, and, the, and the bottom, you know, the... So here's my favourite question to ask tech employees. Sure. Yep. Would you like to come and work in the UK where you'd have complete healthcare for you and your entire family, no matter who you work for? The answer is always yes. Uh, right? Not always. So if you're a smart I mean, employee for these companies, so you should be working in their European HQs where there's full sure, cradle-to-death healthcare of them and social cover. Well, that's not the... 
It's not right. the feedback that I, I got. I, from I would, if I was Apple and, and <laughs> Facebook, I would be building in a so, place that where leaning into social services makes sense. I wouldn't be building here. I, I, I think that there's a there's a big country between the coasts <laughs> that there, that's a pretty pretty big opportunity for it, for it and you know and I'm not necessarily it's not that I don't think you the don't have to be, be based in the country where all your revenue comes from. No, I, I, it's just the question of whether people want to move out of the but, country. But we're not based in Ireland. <laughs> <laughs> I, mean, all right. I don't want to move. I just know like, you know, how much I'm paying in Los Angeles. If I were to move back home to Pittsburgh, like I could have an entire ridiculous studio for what I'm paying just here. And, and I, I mean, mm. it really does come down to it. It's like, do you want to move? And I mean, I, I don't really want to move back home. I like it here. I like, you know, I tried. It's really cold. Friends. Oh. It is really cold. Yeah. I tried, so I, I, just, I tried, I tried to persuade my wife to move to Pittsburgh. We actually moved for a, a year. And it yeah. turned out to be like the coldest winter in 20 years. <laughs> and uh, it was a hard sell. It was a hard oh, sell. And for, just Calif for, just for Southern the... California girl, she was like, mm, hmm. no, no. And just for the person I... in the chat room who's saying I would have to pay more taxes if I was in the in Europe or the UK, and the answer is no, actually. Uh, I actually pay less tax in the UK than you do here. But you brought up the healthcare. I mean, that's mm. such a huge point. I mean, just even now, it's like mm. even my parents, you know, they hadn't used their insurance for years. And now that they finally have to use it, they've switched off the old insurance. It's like such a, it's an incredible hassle. Yes. And it's just really unfortunate that that's, you know, yep. the, what we are in right now. But uh, will uh, the tech solve that? Maybe we need just better conferencing yeah. and then everything will Absolutely. be solved. <laughs> if, if we had better conferencing, all of this would be fixed. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> it exactly. would be moot because okay. then you wouldn't. Would I mean, I mean the, the, you know, and I, I uh, we'll move on to the next thing in a second here. But the uh, um, my uncle uh, invented some medical stuff that did pretty well. And um, I was talking to him. This is when the first single payer conversation was happening in the 90s. And, and, um, and, and I asked him, like, what is the how would you fix the healthcare system? And he goes, oh, we just have to realize, his, his opinion was, and he builds tools that keep people alive, that people die. And he goes, the problem we're going to get into, and he just yeah. predicted this 20 years ahead, is that he said, you're going to spend all of your insurance money in the last six weeks or the last six months of your life. Everything you put into the system is going to get used up at the end, which means that doesn't, the insurance process doesn't really work because yeah. you're just going to burn it all up. And so he says, at some point, we're going to have to start making really hard decisions because our technology, he was a mm -hmm. technology company, Technology is going to um, get to a point where we can keep people alive, alive, that, uh, alive forever, a, and we don't want to make that decision. We right. don't want to be the one that, that is a U.S. Plug. and that is and a United a, States problem. That is not necessarily a problem in Europe. For example, they actually have commissions which study the cost of medicine versus the um, mm -hmm. value of life or the the quality of life. Yeah, I don't and think Americans you, are ready for that. Like, I, mean, I think that's the problem. I think that that you, mm -hmm. you can have that, that, and you need that to make a single payer work. And I'm not clear. Yeah. Uh, I'm you not have clear. to have a community I'm insurance not clear system Americans to make it work. Are, are ready, ready you for have that. to have a community insurance right. for healthcare. Mm -hmm. Now, whether that's a commercial community healthcare or a government sponsored one doesn't really matter. The answer is a right. community healthcare system. Right. I think Pete Buttigieg gets it completely right where he says Medicare for those who want it. I think that, that, right? I think that makes that, a lot of sense. That makes sense. So that is, you know. if you want health care mm -hmm. and you can't find it anywhere else, there's a Medicare I system. I think people want it. I think in, and if you don't America, want it, you don't want it, that's okay. And, don't and sign and up I say, for it. I want to say, to be, to be clear, I would prefer a single payer health care. Like that's what I would prefer. Yep. You know, um, I just don't think that it's, it's uh, I think that a, I don't think that's going to work anytime soon. I don't think, I, I just it think- It works in years, other countries. It does, but it doesn't. But getting, that, getting a country the size of the US it, to transform itself in the current political yep. climate is- not like that happen, but if you ever want to study a community healthcare, which is um, both a combination of public and private mm -hmm. medicine, that is government funded as well as private practice, where you can choose which one you want, go and study the Australian system. Mm -hmm. It's a fascinating study yeah. uh, and it's a great success story too, as far as I'm concerned, as far as I believe. Yeah, absolutely. Yeah. Speaking of medicine, we have an interesting story of, of how medicine is going to be delivered in the future. I was just about to This is crazy. To it's crazy. So, Justine, do, yeah. do you see your drugs being, uh, your, your prescription drugs, not your drug drugs? Okay. The, <laughs> yeah. It is California. Saying, marijuana yeah. is California, legal. I mean, you could be delivering marijuana, like you could, delivering a high from high on <laughs> high. It'd be, it'd be great. But, uh, but prescription drugs, do you see this something that you would use as, as having, uh, having your prescription drugs delivered to your house? What I mean, in this article specifically, it was talking about people who aren't able to go to the store and have right. it delivered. But I'm not sure. I mean, don't they have just regular delivery systems? Like, do they have to have the drones? I also I think a lot of it has like, to do with expense. Yeah, that's I guess that's a good point, too. But yeah. this was specifically talking about UPS and CVS partnering together. Mm -hmm. And I thought it was very interesting having a drone delivering your drugs. But I also feel like you could just 
catch that drone very easily. And I feel like if there's people out there that are trying to get these drugs that are flying around in the sky, they're going to figure it out. <laughs> so I don't know. I'm a I, was, yeah. I think I think the thing that I was looking at was like, is that it drops it from 20 feet. Like I was like, yeah. like I was reading the article, I was like 20 feet. Like I just, I just, I'm just waiting for it. I guess they decided it's, it's a little box. It's not very heavy mm. and uh, it probably won't hurt anybody if it hits them in the head. But I, I, I but that was kind of my, like, I don't know how that's yeah. going to work. Like the doorstep? Like where does it You can't really land at? it. I mean, I understand that you can't really, yeah. you don't want to be trying to land the drone because that's really where the 20 feet, as you said, you could get a hold of the drone. I mean, the, the question is, is it, is it worth it? Is it worth mm. um, trying to steal something from a drone that you don't know what's in it? I think, you know, that's like, you don't know whether that, that box is worth it, you know, to, to get, to go to jail. They steal packages all the time. So it's like a, you, like, I, I think one day somebody stole something. It was just like a bunch of sandbags without the sand in them. I was mm. like, where did my sandbags go off of <laughs> my doorstep i'm like they're gonna be really disappointed because that's not a good steel what, yeah. what i'm that amazed by is that nobody has, nobody has done a show where it's just constantly catching people using technology like i'm always surprised that we don't have a show that is like i and there's part of me that wants to do it my wife has told me i'm not allowed to <laughs> you know she's but yeah. but i really want to do one we put cameras in it and we and we do something where we yeah. you know like and, yeah. and, and people are like no. somebody did it once but it was right I have on the a edge friend of the law. Also did that too. They created a whole Amazon package which had a camera, mm -hmm. and then it would uh, put out some uh, fart gas, and then it would eject tinsel. It's on YouTube somewhere. It is, but it turned out that the yeah. person stealing it wasn't really a per wasn't really well, a. A couple of them were done for just to, to yeah. Pr yeah. Anyway, I, I think I the interesting part about the GPS drone delivery thing here is box, that. Though. Um, it's an interesting test of an idea and it comes back to this idea of trialling out the idea to see what works. Can mm -hmm. you drop a parcel? Um, I just wish these companies would go and do it without trying to make a media circus out of it and lean us in a direction of something that's pointless, like for this. But what I did see the, the other day was a hospital that straddled two sides of a motorway mm -hmm. and they were sending the um, pathology samples from one side to the other using a drone. <laughs> so it's literally a pre What could possibly go wrong? Well, this is the point is, is this is actually working for them because for them to drive between the two took 45 minutes, right. but it takes five minutes for a drone because <laughs> they what, don't have to go out. What would possibly go wrong with taking vials of blood and, and flying it over the highway? I mean, like, I don't know what could, yeah. what? But apparently it's made a massive well, difference because now they're talking about several it. zombie movies, if I'm not, yeah, yeah. <laughs> I'm not mistaken. <laughs> <laughs> well, you well, know, Rwanda. Wonder, like, what are the clearances, though, that they, you have to go through? Like, how does the FFA determine, you know, who can fly where? I'm, like, are they all pretty okay? well? That's because all. When I see a drone flying, even though I know that they probably can't see me, I still get a little like, yeah. oh, okay, there's a drone. Like, what is this? So, like, I just don't understand. Like, who's going to say that this is okay? And it's not okay. Like, how am I going to know that's a good drone and yeah. not just the, me the out FAA flying? FAA stuff is pretty well worked out. Yeah, the FAA stuff's worked out. The medical stuff is, as long as the pathologist is willing to sign off on it. So having the chain of medical custody. Mm -hmm. And if you can put it, there's not much difference between a drone and a car. And right. if you can keep your sample, if you can cut the transport time between taking the sample and getting it to the pathology lab from, uh, they were talking about an hour. Because mm -hmm. by the time they took the sample, got it downstairs, put it in a car, person drove the car out of the pathology around the car park onto the motorway across the other side and you know went and hand apparently the drone's doing it in five to ten minutes See, it's a pre-programmed you know drone. if they had it's the old bank driven. suction tubes it would be mm. like a minute yeah, yeah. It'd just be like you know like put a little uh, i gotta say yes it is it. yeah we reinvented the old suction tubes that we're, you know we're seeing a lot all more. that being said though i'm super into the drone delivery so mm. I'm, I'm definitely interested in it rwanda's actually uh cutting edge in that area i think that they're moving uh, they're blood. actually moving blood. pints of blood yeah you know um they're working with it but they i think they're doing a couple different things um there and they they were difficult like we brought i brought a, a drone to rwanda and <laughs> spent a lot of time in customs and so um you know they're not, they're not that they weren't super excited about it but now they're starting to get it figured out yeah. and um it africa is a good example of a place where it really works because um the roadways at night are dangerous mm. not yeah. because of crime but because of just drivers you know um mm. trucks drive down the middle of the road oftentimes There's and no so street lights um and yeah. so the uh uh the so getting from one rural area to another becomes something that becomes much more yes more useful there's so much more and it's so much easier too because there's nothing else in the in the air, in the airspace and again, it just comes down to the chain of custody because they have to monitor the temperature of the parcel in flight to make sure the blood doesn't exceed a certain temperature. But that's all solvable. That's not something we can't easily solve. Right. Yeah. And so do we think that this is going to be something that becomes how we get our packages from Amazon, for instance? Uh, it won't in Europe because everybody lives in highly, t highly packed, dense housing mm -hmm. and there's nowhere for them to land or to drop. Like... 
my house opens onto the street and my back garden is basically the size of this table. Right. And um, your drone delivery, unless it can land in my back garden exactly and very, very precisely, that's not going to work. So it may work in a limited yeah. number of circumstances. This is what I'm saying. Mm -hmm. most, most of this is pointless because it's only going to work for a sl certain small number of but use in some cases. But in some ways, the places where it works... It is the place that it makes the most sense because Absolutely. these areas that are you're sending you're sending prescriptions to an area that is difficult to reach. This is why it shouldn't um, be a headline article. It should just be just being done until something mm -hmm. provable is there. But these companies always want to go out with a media storm and get people's attention. And it's yeah, like, how are you gonna hey, they got on this show. Drone <laughs> how are you going to do drone deliveries to like apartment complexes? And then, I mean, I right. know how many Amazon packages I get. So, I mean, I would have a whole fleet of drones over my house just dropping every 24 <laughs> seconds. Yeah. So, I mean, that, especially like the airspace, like in Los Angeles, I mean, it would just be so incredibly crowded. And then you're going to have to worry about yeah. like noise and then what happens if the drone crashes. So I don't think it's, you know, entirely ready for that but in remote areas and things like that i think it's incredible but it's you're also gonna have to deal with like you know flight What's times yeah. uh, but it's not going to work for sparse I mean, for sparsely populated the drone has to travel so far it becomes less it, cost effective. If you're carrying it solves heavy. problems for suburbia basically yeah. it's all i mean la is a very good test case for it because la is essentially one large suburban area drones, drones can go a long way with enough batteries yeah mm. i mean um, it's just it's just yeah. a matter it's just a weight it's a weight process yeah. um you know we've Put drums up for a long time. <laughs> so anyway, um, so that it's just it's you know so I so mean, it can, they can they can they can go up you know uh, custom drones can you can put more battery power into them and and they they can go a long way you know I mean the the but real restriction a, for a most of that is FCC. Now. What? But then it would be such a bigger drone, and that's just it is, but it's not know, landing. Taking up more more that's true, but it's just more airspace. I feel like that people might be kind of like uh, there's like a drone flying over my house. It's kind of loud. Yeah, so, I, I, I don't, think, I think it's, it, there's a lot of things that determining factors. Yeah, no, I, I think that I mean, in the people might think that it's louder, but a lot of that has to do with the construction of the propellers and you know, and, and the way the engines work. It, I mean, you can some, you can definitely yeah. make them and quieter. UPS trucks are not quiet. Hmm? UPS trucks That's are not really great not point. quiet. I mean, there are right. the the amount, especially since uh, and especially since Amazon has gone to being their own delivery service, the amount of uh, delivery traffic in the United States is just insane. Like the amount of gas wasted delivering packages every day is is just it, it is overwhelming. Uh, but that's I, only until we move to electric. Well, <laughs> if and in moving t to electric, moving to tiny, tiny electric vehicles like drones is that's that's a solution. Yeah, I just wish that Amazon could decide where they're going to leave my package. Would be, yeah. I'd be super excited. Is, that would be that would be the baby step of mm -hmm. the. We can have the whole drone thing, but if they could just leave the packages in one certain place, I have my house. There's like four different places that I have to check. You know, I have to go to my iPhone and look and see. Okay, they've de they've delivered it somewhere. And now I got to go wander around bushes. the house to find it. What? <laughs> just just sign up for it's their in the garage bushes. service. <laughs> Sorry, what'd you say, Justine? I was at it in the bushes. I found packages there quite often, or in my neighbor's house. I was like, they, like you'll they'll send a photo proof of where it is. I'm like, okay, well now I got to go dig over here for it. Yes. But it is really cool that they do at least do that. So it's you've got that proof of delivery. Yeah, did you, I think that there have been some where they, they take the picture and then they take the package. You know, they, they've had some issues with, you know, like they, you know, they yeah. not very many isolated issues that, that made it onto social media. But uh, I've also gotten very very close up pictures of the packages. Which doesn't help. Right. Like, yes, right, yes right. there's it's a like, package there, but there's a box. Yes, it's to be honest, when if you're delivering a hundred packages a day, you might get a little casual about your photography but skills. My <laughs> whole thing is, I'm fine. I'm fine with the the package being wherever it's going to be, as long as you decide where that is. You okay. know, and, and and like it doesn't. You know, I feel like I should put signs up that just have little Amazon arrows, like go here. But then I'm afraid then people would come and take my packages. So it's it's a very complicated situation here with delivery. Uh, <laughs> now, Google. Uh, had you know they came out with cardboard a couple of years ago, which I think is brilliant. I'll just say it right out. Uh, cardboard I think was a brilliant idea, um, and uh, but it didn't work. <laughs> like it's it's like oh, well didn't didn't work that. And uh, being Google, they've decided to um, the Daydream VR obviously got dropped. Mm -hmm. And um, what happened? What happened with this? Did did, did you use uh, Justine? Did you use cardboard much? 
Um, I mean, I thought cardboard was cool. I'm actually working on a series of three videos right now that are 180 videos, and mm-hmm. we're shooting them stereoscopically, so they'll be 3D. So if you have a headset, you can watch it, but you can also view it on YouTube. And one of the interesting things with Google, too, is they found that a lot of people were watching YouTube videos with a headset, just regular YouTube videos. So I feel like creating 180 content, I think, is something that I'm looking more into doing mm-hmm. in like you know the next year, just because you kind of do have that interactive experience. But with VR and 360, I personally get motion sickness. I want to kind of sit and watch content, not like be looking around. And it's so difficult to even start creating 360 content that's engaging and doesn't make people sick. So as far as cardboard and 180 content, like I'm definitely super excited about it. What are you, what are you using it. With the 180, for 180? What cameras? Um, we're using one of the Z cams. Mm-hmm. And then I also, yep. just for myself personally, I use like the Insta360 cameras a lot just for, you know, little um, like easy things for social. But no, I'm pretty excited about it because it looks really good. Mm-hmm. And it's just sort of a fun kind of thing. But I, I'm not a big fan of VR right now. Like it's just, I feel like it's still too early. Like the headsets are heavy and big, but with like the Oculus Quest and the Oculus Go, like that's on the way to what we need. We need that standalone stuff without having cords connecting to computers and things like that. So yeah, I mean, I'm excited about that. I think that the challenge with the the small going smaller is that we're moving by moving away from the computer, we end up with lo- less power. You know, and so uh, one of the things that um, is problematic. I'm working on some VR stuff that is has a lot of polygons, and and uh, and so I mean, I I just did the. I have to. Um, decimate and decimate is getting rid of the polygons um the the first pass at part of the, the project i'm working on right now is 343 million polygons and i was like it's not going to work in a headset <laughs> so so i'm gonna you know so so we're gonna figure it all out yep, and get it down yep. to uh um you know something more manageable but the problem that i run into is that i want to build it there's part of me that just wants to build it for oculus uh, the full headset so that i can you know keep my polygon count and my texture resolutions up much higher than, yep, than what i want yep. to put on a quest um, you know, I think that the thing that I found really interesting about about the cardboard was less of an, a long experience and more of a casual experience. And I think that their expeditions was a great way to to kind of deal with that. Which is, I mean, a cla- expeditions was kind of like you're in a classroom. You're we're going to talk about some certain location, and then we're going to throw you know, we're going to throw you into it for a minute. You know, like not mm. not for a long time, but it's something that's casual that you can kind of put up and look at. And I always thought that that there's a there are there were a lot of use cases for that process, which I'm glad that what they what, what they've done here, by the way, is that they're open sourcing it. So they're yeah. going to make these API, you know, make it available so that it's easy for you to still uh, for developers to keep on developing these processes and and building these out. Now there's a lot of this is I think that they're mostly just not leaving people who have already done development. Um, out in the cold, which is good because Google is not always great at that. Um, you know, like, you know, the, it's the problem that Google has is it's hard to get as hmm. you start to quit things, you know, because they're not working. Well, I think Google's problem is it's, it's building up a reputation for being a quitter and a failure. The more things that they build and fail at, they get a, their reputation suffers and right. they don't seem to care so much because, you know, 90% of the revenue comes out of displaying ads. So that's one thing. I think at this particular point in time, my whole sense of VR is that it's got failure written all over it. And I suspect the real signal for me is that um, we've seen so many VR companies go under and Oculus really hasn't come back, uh, uh, reached any of the promise. But more importantly is that Apple's moved completely away from VR and they're going to this augmented reality. Um, and we've, got some, we've got some topics we might get to later on about AR and whether you, you can have an interesting debate around things like the new Apple AirPods Pro as augmented reality because they're modifying the sound that you hear around you and the Apple Watch is sort of a version of augmented reality rather than a visual thing. So I think one of the challenges that people are failing to understand is that VR, virtual reality, is only visual at this point in time but there's so many other, there's five senses that nobody seems to be thinking about the rest of those and there's a key technology inflection that has to happen for VR to work, CPU, graphics processing, power, battery reduction, localized power power consumption, that sort of stuff. And there's no signs that that is on the horizon. Well, and I, I, I think that actually, you know, one of my, uh, my problems with Oculus in general was my glasses. Mm. And I felt like, you know, Samsung figured out that if you just put like a little wheel at the top, mm. I can take my glasses off, I can throw a gear on, and I can sit there and scroll it and get everything into focus, right? Um, but I can't, 
you know, I couldn't do that with Oculus and I didn't want to go buy extra lenses. I didn't yeah. want to do anything else. I just wanted to have my little wheel. And be, without that little wheel, I, I was left with this having to put my glasses under. My glasses get pushed at a certain angle. So there's this whole process <laughs> of you put the glasses on and now you have to figure out how to turn, you know, like mm. you have to move them inside the Oculus yeah. to get to get them. To this is what work. I mean. The technology is just so all, immature. But, but the, the worst part was, is that I was like, um, how many people are, how many people in the computer business wear glasses. Most well, of Sony, us, Sony figured that at out. At least 50%. Exactly. <laughs> Sony yeah. figured that out by by designing a, a headset that you could wear with glasses. Like the, the Sony Play VR yeah. is, is... But is I think fundamentally, I don't, wanna, I don't want to... Um, I think my problem is, is I, I didn't want to... Um, uh, I didn't want to wear my glasses underneath it. I just didn't want to... I just yep. wanted to put it on and just move move my little scroll. Yep. Like the problem was, I knew that it could be better because I had a Samsung Gear. <laughs> so, I was like, so, so you know, like because I had that, that's, I was just like, "You're ruining this for everybody." That's, you know, that's really hard to to, to develop a a, a system yes. that can correct. But vision, Samsung did like, it, especially my, I, I cheap little headset. My I'm really, like I'm really not interested in a visual reality, a visual virtual reality. I want to see an audio virtual reality. I don't want to see something that's tactile. I want to see something that's much more immersive. I don't want something that just lets me watch TV because I don't watch TV. Well, I think that fundamentally one of the problems that we get into is that is that the people who develop this stuff only know that one area. So they're yeah. VR specialists or they're audio specialists or they're video specialists. And so they think about each one of these things as a silo as opposed to, I want to learn and I want a little bit of all of it. Yeah. I mean, Justine, do you see that as a, as a, as a limiter? For that process? No. Well, it's interesting because I just got a set of Razer headphones. So they actually have haptic feedback and they have a chair as well that also has haptic feedback. So, you know, when you have this connected to your PC or these headphones specifically work with Xbox One, um, it, it, you feel like the vibration and then you can feel like if you're playing a first person shooter, if you're like shot in a specific location, like you can actually feel that. So I think that is sort of taking that next step into 4D. But again, you know, I loved the vibe because the quality of it was great. But again, you had to be connected to a computer. So that's why having the Quest and the Go, like that kind of stuff for me, like I want to be able to take it with me when I'm traveling and just sort of have that, um, you know, something that is easy to use again. I think that's the barrier to entry for a lot of people. Yeah, and I, I think that the ease of use is a real problem because it is always like a setup. And even when I when I get my my son has a birthday party coming up and he's you know he's going to have Oculus running and I, I always think of it as like oh there's a setup now like I got to <laughs> make sure it's like I got to make sure that everything's working and and it's not you know and when it was always just if I left the computer only running Oculus I had a computer for a while it was just dedicated to Oculus because mm. uh, we were doing a lot of development for it and and I um, and so. Uh, it was easy because then you just throw it on sure, and it works. Sure. But if, if my PC is doing, I mean, it's a PC, so if it's doing anything else, you know, yeah. I'm gonna I'm gonna have to figure out why I, it's now no longer what what update. VR. The, is, the biggest is, problem I had is is that I didn't have a strong opinion about PCs. I mean, I did. Yeah. But I did. I have a lot of development. I have Linux machines and I have PC machines and I have lots of other things that I'm using them for different things. I have a PC that I'm doing a lot of photogrammetry on because my Mac isn't powerful enough to do it. I mean, fundamentally, mm. you know, and so, so I spent a lot of time there, but with Oculus, it was like this constant issue of every time there was an update, it no longer worked. <laughs> you were just like, you were yeah. just like, oh my God. This is what I mean. I, of course, me, now, uh, now we got this with Apple yeah. with the last update to the yeah. OS. I haven't even put Catalina on because I'm just kind of like, I don't know what will break yet. I'm yeah. just going to give them like six months to figure that out. Yeah, I just... Yeah, I, I put it on my other machines, but not my main one because I'm also worried, like, is it not going to connect to the server? But uh, right. I mean... The augmented reality, I think, is is still my favorite. Like, yeah. I know when Microsoft was working on HoloLens, like, I thought that was going to be incredible. Yeah. And I just, I love still being in my world, but yet, you know, having it, I mean, obviously augmented, but just having sort of, you not taken out of that, I think is really great. So I'm, I'm excited to see all the future yeah. stuff that Apple is coming out with. And I mean, I know that there's always been rumors of Apple headsets. So I feel like when Apple finally does take the plunge and do that or, or announce it or release it, then it, obviously that's, again, when it will become I think, I think the important, something that's the important, common for the masses. Yeah, the, the stuff important. I've played with, with Magic Leap, um, their AR system is uh, that, is definitely where it is, mm. where where things are going. I it's, think it's, it's a it's it's as powerful as as the Oculus, but mm -hmm. you can see through it, so you can have a, a, a mixed VR AR experience that's much more immersive. That's in my, cool, in my opinion. 
Yeah, th- we'll, we'll be here in five years and you'll be telling me how a great AR and VR, how great VR is and it'll still be incompetent and the vendors will still be promising <laughs> well, everything well, and it'll well, never I mean, I happen. I, think I, think I promise you. The, 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 the issue is, is that... The issue are, is neither Facebook or Google or Microsoft is competent at delivering a product on that sort of complexity successfully. If you look back over the last 20 years, those companies couldn't even deliver a decent operating system. Look well, at Android, look at I Windows. We, I think we saw something, like, Just, for instance, for There's me, no way those companies are ever going to deliver anything that people are actually going to consume. For, for well, me, I think that Robo Recall was the, this could actually, this, this was my moment where this could actually work. <laughs> like, I was, I don't know, Justine, did you play Robo Recall very much? I didn't, no. Oh, my gosh. So, for me, for, in Oculus, Robo Recall was, oh, my gosh. This could actually work. This we could you could actually turn this into a business because I felt like it was so immersive. It was fluid. It you know had um, you know didn't have the frame rate issues. Um, you know as a special effects person had a little bit of aliasing, but in, in general it was it was very good. Um, and and I and I was like this is really um, the future, mm. but it's one app. You know, like, and, and, and it's, and it was, you know, done, I think, you know, and, and I think that that, I don't think a lot of people haven't figured out a way to, you know, to, to do that again, you know, and, and I'm, I'm sure there's and a bunch of VR is, people that are now And upset. that is, that app pushes the boundaries of, of what uh, Oculus is capable of. And that's why phone-based VR has, has failed is. It's just, it's not powerful enough to do anything more than a gimmick. Yeah, and I think that AR, I think that AR... It doesn't matter. Any of this is nothing to do with it. None of the companies that are doing VR are competent at delivering a consumer-grade product that people can buy. Google, Facebook, Microsoft, any of the virtual reality companies out there are fundamentally incompetent at reaching the the consumer market. Google is good at making ads. Microsoft wants to build a public cloud. Facebook wants to rip people off to display them banner ads with targeted marketing. That is none of that is virtual reality. Hololens is pretty cool. I mean, it's the team within Microsoft. It doesn't matter how cool the technology. But it's it's very. We have to look at like the lesson of the last twenty years is it doesn't matter how cool your technology is. It has to be focused on quality and who the buyer is, and nothing in the VR market is focused on those things. Well, and and admittedly, Hololens is more of an AR solution than a than a VR solution. But it is. It did uh, try uh, Hololens. I think it was like two or three years ago at um, at E3, and it was pretty awesome. Like you went through like this amazing demo, and just you know, I'm a huge believer and fan of AR. I think over VR. So I'm excited to see what the future yeah. holds for it. I think but I think creating an AR is going to be really interesting, especially me as a creator, you know, doing my own kind of things like that. Like it's going to be really fun. Yeah, and I think that the tools, and which we'll talk about a little later in the show, the tools are becoming a lot more um, fluid, you know, to allow you to do that. And I think that Adobe and Apple and um, mm-hmm. you know Unreal and Unity are all making it yep. easier for us to Only do that. Now we're gonna I'm gonna have to yep. slow us down here because I I haven't. We were about to. Um, we're gonna talk about the FBI. And, the, and face tracking in a second. But first, Leo's got a couple words for us. Uh, hello, just let me interrupt for a second. I want to talk a little bit about ZipRecruiter. I am an expert. We use it at Twit. We hired uh, one of our most recent uh, interns. We've hired a number of people through ZipRecruiter. Hiring is a hard thing to do. I, uh, You know, you're down a person, you need a person, um, you're gonna get. You're afraid you're gonna get a lot of phone calls and your a lot of mail in your inbox and all that stuff. I know. I know. Pushing that button on posting a job is always. There's always a little trepidation involved. Not with ZipRecruiter. First of all, when you post once, just once to ZipRecruiter, that post goes to more than a hundred job boards plus social networks like Twitter and Facebook. It goes to everywhere. You're reaching out to the most possible candidates. Now, don't let that scare you because they don't call you. They don't email you. Every applicant goes right into the ZipRecruiter interface. They format it, make it easy to read. They all look the same, so you can scan them quickly. They have uh, screening questions, yes, no, true, false, even essay questions, so you can eliminate candidates that don't work very quickly. Uh, They also rank the uh, incoming applicants, so you're gonna never going to miss the best possible candidate. So don't worry about getting a lot of applications. That's the whole point. You know, you want to comb through all of the possibilities to get that perfect person. It's so important. They do one other thing that I think is really important. Actually, maybe you saw the uh, the TV ad. Normally, hiring takes a long time, and that's not good. You need to hire somebody often. Uh, the TV ad had that guy from Cafe Alturo. Altura? Yeah, he's the COO, Dylan Miskowitz. He needed a director of coffee. He had been advertising the job for some time on other boards, but was having trouble 
finding qualified applicants. He switched over to ZipRecruiter, and that's when the magic begins. ZipRecruiter doesn't just depend on candidates finding you. It actually finds candidates for you. Its technology identifies people with the right experience that invites them to apply to your job. So that means you get qualified candidates, and you get them fast. Our experience has been really fast. Dylan posted his job on ZipRecruiter. He was impressed, he said, how quickly he had great candidate supply. He used that candidate rating feature that brings the top ones to the, the best ones to the top. He was able to focus on the ones that matched his real tight criteria. And you know what? <laughs> Dylan found his new director of coffee in just a few days. Yeah, sorry, he's hired him. <laughs> I wanted to apply myself. With results like that, it's no wonder four out of five employers who post on ZipRecruiter get a quality candidate within the first day. We did within the first hour. It was mind-boggling. See why ZipRecruiter is effective for businesses of all sizes. Try it free right now. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. ZipRecruiter is, Z- I know, I'm saying it fast. Z-I-P-R-E-C-R-U-I-T-E-R. ZipRecruiter.com slash twit. ZipRecruiter, it is easily the smartest way to hire. You're going to love it. Now back to twit. And so now we're shifting gears just a little bit. Um, we we uh, have a report that the FBI now is tracking uh, their, our, um, our faces, and the ACLU is uh, understandably a little concerned. And uh, so, so really, this is looking at the overall process of the FBI and probably many other. I mean, they're focused on the FBI right now, um, but uh, it is really looking at, you know, uh, where where does this end where does it where is it going where what are they using it for for us now most of this has not been very transparent um so the i guess the the question um for you is uh, how do we weigh liberty versus security i think the challenge here is do we trust our institutions so at the end of the day we have to believe that these secret services have our best interests at heart and we have historically entrusted, and in the UK we have the same problem with GCHQ and the government doing the same thing. There's mm-hmm. so many cameras in London and in the high streets. It's just like they're just ubiquitous everywhere. And the question is, if we give the government the ability to draw that data together like Facebook does, mm-hmm. the, like the, the thing that Facebook does wrong or the thing that Facebook does that is creepy and non-intuitive is it because it has so much data it can find things that nobody else can it's got so much power Mm -hmm. because of that if we allow governments to do this the potential for misuse or the ability of governments or whoever's currently in politics to use this to say if i look at these faces i can say that that person is in that place and therefore they belong to this voter group so i can target them or i can set up a gerrymander on the basis of it the question here isn't whether the FBI is tracking our faces. The question is, do we trust our institutions? And I think the fact that we don't trust them indicates that society doesn't trust our secret services to do to work in our best interests. So it's not whether they're tracking our faces or our emails or capturing all the data on the transatlantic cables, it doesn't really matter what the actual um, process is. The issue here is, do we trust our governments to work in our, our best interest? Yeah, and I think that the hard part is, is that you're, you're weighing the the process of as someone who works all over the world uh our the the comfort that we live in here Mm -hmm. is unique you know like so you know like we like in in some western countries and so on and so forth but generally western countries that have a lot of intelligence Mm. we get to live without big walls we don't have glass across those walls we don't have full-time security at everybody's house and i work in places where that's the norm yep you know that that you're that you have yeah i've worked in places uh, like papua new guinea and fiji africa and and india and and other places like live inside compounds yep and so everyone lives in compounds because you can't you know you don't have that security you know and so uh so we have that security what we what our countries uh, as an aggregate, these yeah. Western countries that spend, you know, um, that spend a lot of money on on intelligence, you know, a lot of that is happening invisibly for us, you know, we and we just have to be clear that, you know, when we stop doing that, <laughs> yes. you know, like there's a there's a cost on the other end of security mm-hmm. where, you know, we're, you know, that metadata collection and I'm not saying, you know, I, I get a lot, very concerned. I'm, I'm very concerned about giving up security, for instance, on a phone. Mm-hmm. You know, I think that we, you know, a lot of these viruses right now, the wanna cries and so on and so forth, those are... 
It's our, it's our code. You know yeah. that we couldn't keep secret. Yes. So the, the concern I have is less of distrust for the organizations and, and more of their ability to control the data that they have mm. is, is more of the issue because I think that there are a lot of good people doing a lot of things that we don't want to think about or know about um, that, that, has, that has our country. And we have to understand well, that's a, it's easy for us to say we, we want to have un, – it's easiest for us to say we want to be um, – we don't want to have surveillance – but we don't even know what that surveillance is doing. So the, you're making a trade-off there between social safety. So that is, in general society, we have an issue where we trust our neighbour, we trust the people in our community around us, we don't have to worry about that. Um, and, but in the countries that, you know, we're t you and I have been to, you and my far more with me, um, those social trusts or those social boundaries are different and therefore you have to enact physical defences. So that's different from government. Uh, I don't think you can make a draw a line between high-level secret services tracking the entire population to what's happening socially in a small group of people. But I do agree that there's no trust in certain countries and that's what you end up with. If you don't trust the society that you live in, if you don't trust each other, you end up with compounds living behind walls with security guards and that sort of stuff. Justine, are you concerned about face tracking in public? I mean, that's, I feel like, the least of my concerns at this point. I mean, you, you, there's just... I feel like the whole privacy issue, like anytime you post anything online and especially the amount of content that I have posted, uh, it's, I'm voluntarily giving this information out. And I think, I, you know, as I've been doing this longer and longer, I've been posting less and less, but just the whole deep fakes thing, there's enough photos and audio clips of me that anyone can make me say or do whatever I want. So that for me is kind of concerning. Um, you know, I think the FBI obviously is, they have way more power than I think that we would ever imagine. And I think if anybody wants to do something like they're going to figure out a way to do it, no matter what, whether you're in the FBI, whether you work for a phone company and you're able to access someone's records and then take their phone number and then be able to change all of their passwords. So there are so many things that I think that a lot of people don't even realize that they're giving up on a daily basis from going into the grocery stores to shopping, all of those cameras, everyone is tracking you somehow. And what's interesting with a lot of the stores now is they are tracking you as a person, your age, race, um, you know, gender, your shopping habits, where you go in the supermarket, what you end up purchasing. And no one ever thinks twice about that. And like, is there a way that, you know, we can say that we don't want to do that? I mean, how do you opt out of something like that? Mm. Well, I have to admit that I, 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 um, I used to be very, you know, I, I, there was one time in, in Colorado that they started, they rolled out taking your thumbprint when you got your driver's license. And I was so angry about that that I actually burned my thumbprints off <laughs> before I went in to mm. flatten them. And I was like, I'm not giving them my thumbprint. And I, I bought everything in cash. And I was very, you know, I, mm. if I had a tinfoil hat, I would have worn it. You know, I was like, they're not going to get any of my information. And after doing as much work as I have in a variety of different locations, I just gave up. Like, I'm just you like, the, yeah. the key is just to live a boring life and not, yeah. not do anything weird. Cause, cause it's just, you know, it, 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 you know, there, there's all this tracking, you know, mm -hmm. that that happens, and it's so. Uh, and this, it's th so. You know, I, I, what I'll say is, I guess I, mean, I am concerned about, you know, mm -hmm. and, and I'm mostly concerned because we're seeing where that can really go wrong in China, in my opinion, where they're using it as the social credit and they're paying attention to an enormous amount of things about people that, and and actually controlling their lives with it. And so I think that we get into the situation where we, we can say, it's easy for us to say that, oh, our government mm -hmm. would never do that, but do we know? Do well, we know the flip side of that is to, to a lesser or greater extent, we actually have it here, it's called a credit score. And you're actually, um, in the Western world, your credit score defines what you can and can't do. You're restricted as to how much you can buy, your, you know, what sort of car loan you can get, that mm -hmm. type of stuff. So there is aspects of that in our life. It's just different. So sometimes try not to... And rudimentary. Uh, yeah. It's, it's, it's very rudimentary compared yeah, but, to... Uh, well, it's, you know, it's also what they say. The story that we hear doing, through the talking. media is very much... I, I just want to be concerned here that the, the reality on the ground that the day-to-day -day of what the Chinese government's doing for monitoring is about the same as what a credit score is in oh, this country. It's so it's not quite... More aggressive, I think. But the point I'll go back to is the, it, the everything that you've said is... At the end of the day, you have to have trust in your institutions. And this is where Google and Facebook and Amazon are making a mistake, is we are losing our ability to trust them to act in the best interest of us as people. When they go sharing that data, when they go giving away that information or being creepily um, 
stalking us around the place. What they're actually doing is creating a breach of trust between you and I and breaching the trust contract that we have. We have to be able to trust them. And when they continually breach that contract, we actually end up in a situation where society begins to break down. And that's the problem with Facebook and Google is we can't trust them. I mean, I think going into that, knowing that you can't trust them it also sets a precedent as well. So it's like, maybe I won't share as much information, but at some point, you yeah. know, you just kind of realize that this is, this is what it is. And yeah. I think that's my point is, the but the answer is generation. if you go into the situation, not trusting him, it's like when you go to buy a used car from a guy on the, sh on the corner of the road and he's going, oh mate, runs brilliant. You definitely want to get in this. It, it's engine's great. Just got the tires, you know, like, but your hackles are up and you know that this guy is probably going to try and foist a lemon on you. And you're in a situation where it's a hostile business transaction but when you go to the supermarket to buy milk for your children you've got to be able to trust that the milk is clean and safe that it's been through the cold chain all the way through so that milk that comes out is healthy and fit to eat there's a completely different level of trust about does it does that person buying right. that milk know that they're being tracked now that they've bought the milk now that person but, has yeah. now facial recognition that now they know that they bought that milk that they also bought the specific mm. type of cheerios so now they're going to be starting to get facebook ads for that specific type of thing and i don't care what anybody says like there is a hundred percent someone is listening somewhere because i will talk about something me and <laughs> a bunch of my friends and I will get a, an ad for that thing. And it is the most obscure things. We will even test this out and start talking about the most insane things that you will think. And the next day there's an ad for something related to that. Yeah. And Instagram. that is just Instagram. Crazy. We tracked it down on my wife's phone. It was Instagram. As long yeah. as she's running Instagram or it's running in the background, that's how they find it. It's, it's fascinating, but also terrifying at the same yeah. time. But the point is that it comes back. If you but beyond, beyond, well, secret beyond services, that. whether it's GCHQ or, mm -hmm. you know, MI5 or MI6 in the UK or any of the Five Eyes countries, we have to, my problem is, is that I need to trust them. I can't stop them from collecting secret information and building up databases. In fact, I want them to for terrorists. The question is, do you trust them or not? And that's and, the problem. And again, I think my problem is less about do I trust them to gather the information and to even use it in our best interest. My concern is, their ability to control it, yeah. you know, and, and, and because they can't, we can yeah. argue that the, and, and for me, the, the fundamental trust that, that is broken there, the, the, as my kids would refer to the circle of trust, <laughs> um, that, that is broken there is, uh, that we lost what we can, could consider some of the most important between Snowden and, mm. yes. and, um, the, uh, information that was lost, um, you know, uh, uh, that a lot of our, our worms and so on and so forth getting lost. That's some of the most important information that that agency has, yep. and they lost it. You know, yep. they, they can't even control that that data, and our data doesn't matter to them nearly yep. as much as that data. So when, when you have important data that you can't keep control of, yep. it seems what worries me is that you know. It, and, the second and, part of what Snowden, Snowden showed about, is the, is they're, the they're, abuse of that data, right? Exactly, they're, that, that data is out part. there, and you have individuals who are unaccountable that are just wandering around and looking at people. You know, in the same way that you know, and so and and the problem is, is that that I think it, it's less about the agencies for me, mm. and more about individ, you know, individual control. And I think that that's where they have to uh, prove it. And I think that you know, I, I, there, there's parts of the ACL you thing that I think are a little, a little bit of hyperbole, but I think that also that we probably do need to talk a little bit about how it's being used. And yep, that well, that was part of the lesson from the Snowden facial, is we saw them abuse it. The facial information has been being used for a long time. Yeah. Like, 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 like we're talking about it right now, but it's, you know, it's- Google's been using talking, your facial information for, because of all the photos people have uploaded Google, to Google I'll Photos. The government. the yeah, government's been I mean, doing this for well, Definitely the, the second part of your, your, your statement is, is what we have to focus on. It's, I mean, the ACLU is fighting a rear guard action here. The privacy is, is something that it would be nice if we still had, but um, every breach, uh, every, breach of the NSA, every breach of Equifax, every breach of Target has taught us that um, all of our data is is up for grabs at all times. Yeah. Keep in mind that Russian and China leaks data we, like worse than we do. We have to figure do. out how That's to live part. in a privacy-free so. uh, society at some point. Well, and, and, then, and, then, and some of the other valid issues that are coming up is that the facial tracking is much more for a variety of reasons, is much more accurate on lighter skin than darker skin. Yes. So mm. if you have darker skin, it has a lot um, harder time being accurate. Um, and uh, and so... That's, that's the, the algorithms. What? That'll be the algorithms. Initially, well, the algorithms are being trained on 
uh, databases that it's, are available and notated, and a lot of them don't include diverse Well, I think that it's face, a mixture diverse. of, of, of yeah. algorithms, but I think it's also contrast. Yeah. It's yeah. just that it there's not... Contrast. Yeah. That it's it, absolutely the, contrast. The contrast. The contrast issue is, is a real issue yeah. for the computer because, it's you know, okay. low-light situation, fixed it just it. doesn't see The Apple much. iPhone 11 has fixed that. Yeah. It's going to come up with really but great night phone. security <laughs> cameras don't do that. Yeah. You know, they're still not cheap. Not yet, but... Yeah, yeah. That's still cheap, yeah. Cheap well, that, that's one one reason why I'm glad uh, San Francisco and and California and other cities have have banned law enforcement from using facial recognition for three years. Is that it's not quite it's not quite there yet. It allows society some time it's, to catch up and yeah, adapt, I, and people think, to get comfortable, well, and yeah. also gives the governments themselves time to put in mechanisms so that we can trust them. Hopefully, yeah. So the. Uh, um, Apple, Apple, on the other end, has revamped their privacy site headlines. Everyday apps designed for your privacy. Uh, Justine, is this a is this a winning formula for Apple? I mean, I think for me too. Like you know, using different email addresses for things is always you know a high priority. So for using the sign in with Apple, like I'm really excited for people to start implementing that because you'll know exactly where a breach or something has happened. But they did. Uh, I'm not sure if you guys saw the video that they played. It was like the new commercial about the privacy, but it was really. I mean, I thought it was kind of a touching video. It just showed how much of your information really is out there. And I think when you stop and think how much stuff is on your phone, it's shocking. So I think for Apple to kind of step up and sort of make this move and show how important this is and really make an entire commercial and video dedicated to it, I think it's it's a pretty bold move. It's a it. I sense that this is this feels like a very slow move. You know, it's a very they're not they're not scaring anyone but we're at they just keep on adding little they just keep on tightening these mm. little bolts very slowly so it's kind of you know they're kind of like when you put on a tire and you keep on going around and yeah. you just keep on tightening these bolts you know very very slowly so that in you a keep certain it all order even. yeah but but it's not uh they're not just going okay we're going to turn the security all the way on because there's a lot of places that they they could go you know yeah. and and i think that um you know and i think that they're they're not tightening it so much that people go crazy yeah. But I, you know, when you look at that trajectory, it feels like they could go, you know, they could tighten this a lot. Like for instance, I think that the email is good. Um, you know, the, I think basically allowing developers to have an anonymized um, relationship with their users where it it's fixed. I know that I'm talking to that person, a person, mm. um, but I don't know who they are. Yep. And that, that anonymizing of the data is incredibly valuable because you can do a lot of things that people won't trust you to do otherwise. Mm. And I think that that, and, and it does seem like they're going to make it harder and harder. Yeah, as, as I said, in the, they're kind of boiling a frog, yep. <laughs> a security frog. And I, this comes back to my point. People trust Apple to get this right. So when it comes to this privacy and keeping your data secure and respecting you as, a, as an individual and that sort of stuff, then Apple is building that trust that other institutions are. This is... And it's very interesting. I think if Apple actually ratcheted up to maximum, like you said, mm. it'd be interesting to see if they would actually provoke Facebook, Google, and others into a reaction. So if Apple became so private that the secret services weren't able to track people or that Facebook started to lose valuable analytics data or that Google wasn't able to do targeted advertising, they would provoke a reaction from those institutions. Well, I think the concern is they provoke a reaction from the government. Like less less about no, the no, you have to, from Google you and have Facebook, to, but it's and they have provoked it's not just the government. A, a, you have to, you can't just keep blaming the government for everything. Jesus, Americans, not, you have no, to no, calm no. down. No, 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 I'm not. It's I'm not. business and government, right? And society. You have three. You have four states, right? And you have society. You have the business community, and you have the government. But the, the, the 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 organization most trying to stop Apple from going down the security path is the FBI, not Google or Facebook. Mm. Google and Facebook are uncomfortable with it, but the ones that are talking about it in Washington well, all the time, and, and, and Facebook the ones that are passing laws in Australia are security, the you know, like are, are, are government agencies. That's the problem. But the, the governments are talking about it in public, but Google and Facebook are making moves behind the scenes to bypass the privacy that Apple's putting in place constantly. But, but that's a whack-a-mole. Well, I think a lot of is also, is also saying that they are going to encrypt uh, WhatsApp end-to-end -end mm -hmm. and uh, and make there. I mean, Zuckerberg is making all sorts of, at least statements about how privacy is the future. Or you saying, Justine? Know I Justine, trust what, him or not. what were you saying there? Well, I mean, of course, Zuckerberg is going to say that. <laughs> exactly. I mean, exactly. It's Facebook. I was going to say that too. A, yeah. <laughs> yeah, but I mean, for a lot of like normal consumers, like people like my parents and my mom, like they don't want to have to be worrying. Like I go home and I make sure that I have, you know, Face ID. I have all of their things secured and locked. 
because that's not something that like a normal everyday person is going to be concerned about. But it is like, what if you lose your phone and I'm like, you didn't have a passcode on? Like, why not? Oh, like those I- simple things like everyone should be doing. And, you know, for Apple to kind of make this video that is widely available to like everyone, I think is it's a good move. And it just makes normal everyday consumers a little bit more aware that privacy is a huge issue. Yes. You have so much information on that phone. Be careful. And and I, if, you know, I, was, I, if, I, I was talking to my mom. My, my, my mother has a PC. She's, you know, she's very committed to it. And she's and she's got all these viruses. And then she's got this stuff popping up all the time. And I'm like, what are you doing with it? Well, I'm, ta- I'm doing email and I'm doing this. Other. I'm like, just get an iPad. Like, yeah, like, you know, like, this, yeah. this wall will just go away. If, you know, you know, like, it's just, it's a closed system. And, and the same problem with my and, brother. And he just couldn't cope with the I computer. Have, I gave him an iPad and it was all solved. I have yeah. PCs. I have Linux. I have Androids. I have, you know, I have all this stuff and I use them all every day. But I know what I should and shouldn't be doing yes. with those things, you know, and it's kind of like, you know, it's, it, they're powerful and they, and they're, they're valuable. But for my mom, you know, like it's, it's kind of like, she just, just needs an iPad, you know? And, that's, and, and, and that, that comes and down it, to, so for me, same thing, <coughs> all of my family uses phones because I know that the privacy and generally the security is good. Yeah. So I, I come back to my if, trust point. I you, trust if, Apple to get it mostly. If you don't use password as the password. Yeah. You know, they, like, <laughs> Uh, and and the the best advice I, I I got was you know I have you know my my phone is uh you know get away from the four digit or six digit this is our little PSA here for a second is think of a phrase that you remember from your childhood that mm. no one would know and use that phrase and don't ever say it out loud yeah. to anyone riding ever, my bike up even, the street don't tell R M you know, but but uh, just just it doesn't have to have any special letters no it's just a a long phrase like my my phrase. Is 26, no, I'm not going to tell my phrase. My phrase <laughs> is, is, someone say shushing me. I'm going to say my phrase is Frank I went know, to the market. Of no no one's ever going to guess Frank wrong. went to the market. It's great, isn't it? Yeah. No, um, it is, uh, but it's 26 characters long, you know, and it's not the alphabet in case you're wondering. It just happens to be 26 characters. But the point is, the only time I get upset is like my, my battery goes out and then I, yeah. now I'm like, oh my gosh, I have to type this. <laughs> you know, like, you know, so, so it's, but, but it's a phrase that I'm always going to remember and it's always you mm. know going to be there. And, and the thing, and no one at 26 characters, no one. Mine is my, is uh, my favorite one is to use a, when I'm creating a password to get into my password manager mm-hmm. is to use a phrase where it's, is really um, outrageous. Something that mm-hmm. you could never say out loud because you'd be in instant trouble. Right? <laughs> <laughs> and so when you're sitting there t- going to yourself, I, I use my, the example of riding my bike up the street, you know, mm. I, R, M, B, R, mm. T. And what you do is you use swear words or really bad words and then you'll never mm. say it out loud. Yeah, there, 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 there. <laughs> Oh my gosh, there. you're giving yeah. away all the secrets. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> but those are the. But, well, but that's, that's the, hard too. But a lot of these security questions is like, where were you born? Well, I can Google it and I can figure out where you were born. What was your mother's maiden name? Well, everyone knows who my mom is, so let's look it up. So these questions are almost too simple. That mm-hmm. the fact that like I can't actually use any of those. Or they all. ask. Or they ask. Comp, they ask ones that are harder, but then I can't remember what they are because I can't remember what I, I said. Know. And so they're like, they're like, like you know, who's your favorite well, this? You should, or what's your favorite you that? Just and use, you're like, you should take those as. Uh, uh, secondary passwords. I I don't I don't answer those questions. I have I have secondary passwords for those questions. Well, I mean, you were even talking about. I mean, one of the sponsors of the show was LastPass. I've been using LastPass for a long time as well, and they've sponsored a bunch of my videos. And it's great because I will store you know information in there that I wouldn't store in like my Notepad or anything yeah. like that. And just to have all of those passwords, every single account has a yeah. different password, and it's it really the, is. I mean, it's such a process. And but. the only issue I have with with LastPass is mostly that if it's not on the web, it just gets more complicated. I never get to it, you know. So if it's a, so, I hate apps yes. that pop up and want a password because it's getting I'm just it's like, getting better. It's getting better. My favorite one is when it, it says, what's your easily, favorite first pet's us. name? And I always use the word spankalicious, which, like, <laughs> which gives me a little smile. When I, I have a pet that. name that or something is not like a that. pet that yeah. I use that is my pet, is my pet name. <laughs> you know, like, exactly. you know, like that it's a different, different oh, wow. yeah, yeah. Well, no, it's like, it's like you have to have, I, yeah. it's not that I have a pet that I actually use for it. It's yeah. just that I have a the generic pet name. I like to make up just used. crazy words like right. snuggle or flunk or grunkle right. or something and just type that in there and then record that in my You'll password You'll never manager. remember. <laughs> yeah, but I'll record it in the password manager and whatever, you know. Yeah. So you exactly. can you can go and have a go at cracking my accounts, but my <laughs> don't bother looking up my first pet or something like that because it won't help you. Yeah, 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 yeah. exactly. So uh, speaking of, we're going to continue down the security path here uh, just for one more pass is that we now have, and this gets back into the trust of your organization. Mm-hmm. Um, two, two former Twitter employees charged with spying for Saudi Arabia by digging into the accounts of the kingdom critics. So, so these are two different folks that got brought in and they're basically, they worked for Twitter 
And then they use their access at Twitter to start figuring out who is complaining about the about the kingdom. Mm. And and this is a, you know, obviously this is what we worry about. Like this gets past, past the whole, am I worried that Twitter is doing political ads or, or anything else? It's more of, am I worried that an average person at Twitter has access to, now, and, and it matters less to me because for the most part, I don't put anything online that, like I would not use Twitter to have a conversation that was personal. <laughs> and if I if I thought I was gonna say something dangerous, I would go through an enormous number of hoops yeah. to put it on Twitter where you'd so, have to, you know, you'd get through three VPNs and do a whole bunch of things if I thought my life was in danger. So I don't trust I don't trust Twitter to do that anyway. Here. But people do and they they are this is an important political tool. So the challenge here is that when a lot of these tech companies are very immature in their terms of their data security. And they also did very little to validate the people that worked for them. And um, I have various discussions with people in Silicon Valley over time. And if you worked for any one of the major uh, technology companies, once you're an employee, for a while back there, everybody had access to all the data. You could see anybody's user. And you know, you, these stories that we're hearing about somebody inside the organization was snooping on potential girlfriends or looking for bikini pictures and that sort of stuff. That's because these companies didn't have internal data controls. And if you read between the lines here, these people were actually accessing accounts in 2015. Now, what the technology companies are now saying, and Twitter in this case particularly, and Facebook has now subsequently implemented, is data control. So if you're an employee and you shouldn't be looking at this data, now you can't. And this is a testament to just how well, badly and, organized. And, and the, the, my understanding is, is not only can you, if you can, yep. you need to know that someone is going to call you Yes. and ask you why you looked at that account? Like at this Yes, point, they didn't have any sort you, of logging. You tie into some random They didn't person's, used to have any sort of know, logging but, but on what you looked like, at. It is, they like, didn't check the, if you were, had privileges. If you were just anyone in the system had to look at anything, yeah. they could go and look but, up. But at this point, there's a, a lot, in most of these organizations yeah. in the last couple of years, in 2019, they've spent- Incredible, incredible amount yeah. of, of and oversight. And that's what they're complaining things. and bitching and whining about because that costs them money. Every time they have to put these data controls in place, mm -hmm. it restricts the abilities of the employees to move fast, to innovate and bring new products to market. Backups get harder, security controls get mm -hmm. harder because when you do a backup, you have to encrypt the backup. A lot of their backups weren't even encrypted mm -hmm. five years ago. Right. So I'm a little okay with this in the sense that this was 2015 and Twitter's now gone on to restrict and apply data controls. So they've closed the door after the horse has bolted. Mm -hmm. But... Um, you know, welcome to Silicon Valley where the kids play with their toys and don't care who gets hurt. And maybe we'll wait and see if it was done in 2018. I mean, it, it, when we say that, I just want to make sure that we're clear that it's welcome to every new business. I mean, whether it was the railroads, whether yeah. it was in industry, it was always, you know, people were moving and, fast and fast and furious for a couple of decades and then it all kind of yeah, calmed down. And if so, your but, whole but business is information, those data controls should have sure. been there from the start. Uh, they should have been introduced way say, earlier but, than... But the, it's, it's hard to... It's it, When you're trying to figure it out, no, you don't even kids. know. just kids. Look at, like, the people yeah. in charge of Google and Twitter and Facebook are all just high school kids that manage to get old without having to take up adult responsibilities. They're all fools. And it wouldn't I don't happen think they were in high school when they started Twitter. <laughs> <laughs> they, they sure act like it now. So, you know, yeah, it, I, I don't know. I, oh, I mean, I'm I just, sorry. Obviously. We didn't get it right. We'll try harder tomorrow. That's like a 15 year old who's been caught running between holes. Because the adults run PG and E. See, we're, yeah. we're here. I'm in here in, in, in Northern yeah. California and I had my, my power turned off for four days because people didn't make any of the right decisions, both but in the government and in the company. And those were adults. I, I, <laughs> yeah, so, I, so I'm not. So I, I think I think that the, the, the goes around. What were you Arguably. saying, Justine? No, I just think it's a lot. It's really crazy because a lot of these things, you know, never. I think in anyone's wildest dreams would they ever expect that Twitter became what it is today. So obviously, you start building this infrastructure, and you're not planning for it to be what it is now. And so I think you know the fact that it did take them that long. I mean, they probably should have done that sooner. But I think it's just hard when you're thrown into something and you're like. What do we do now? Well, and, and, and for a lot of these startups, it's like, you know, I, I, there was a great interview. Now I can't think of what, there was a, there's a podcast or something where they're, inter, and I, it might be NPR or something, but they interview entrepreneurs, you know, so they've, inter, and they were interviewing the, the guys that started Instagram mm. and they were just saying, you know, it was kind of like, well, things weren't working. And, and then we threw together this little thing on a server and then the server was so popular it crashed. Sure. And then, and the problem is, is that once you have something that, that, in a startup, once you have something that takes off, there is a, you're now trying to, you're no longer fixing a 
stationary train. You are fixing a train that is going faster than you even know how to steer it. Yeah, yeah. And so, yeah, but but yeah. we have to. But it's it's easy for us to say when we don't do it. But the problem is, is that when you're doing it, you're in the middle of it's moving really fast, and and you have to figure out how to do it without stopping it. Yeah, but they got billions of dollars. These but kids got billions of dollars in profits, not, and they initially. didn't do well, but anything. Not, but not initially. They never not did. Like the yes, they did. In 2015, Instagram. Twitter was rolling in cash, know, but, but, and they did nothing. All they did was trouser all that money and congratulated themselves with how clever they were but, without doing any uh, of the disciplined hard work that you need to do. think without being in Twitter, it would be hard for you to know that. Because it, 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 there's a lot of work that gets <laughs> done in a lot of these companies where there's a lot of concern about this stuff. There's a lot of... Um, you know, it's not that it's easy to say from the outside, oh, well, they're not doing anything, but they're all working on it. And they have been all working on it for a long time, you know, and, yeah, but and I, badly, uh, well, right? you can't keep excusing. You've got to stop making excuses. The it's thing is, a lot of these problems are problems that you, you have no idea you're going to face until you faced them. No, like, it was entirely predictable. Entirely predictable. If your data is not in secured and segmented and need to know, this is going to happen. Entirely predictable. The executive team in charge of all of these companies, Facebook, Google, fa uh, Twitter, failed I, to implement that's, perfectly that's, reasonable but controls. But no one predicted that initially. I think Everybody in predicted that. We've been saying it in the, IT, yeah. in the IT industry for 10 years. Yeah, I mean, it, the, the, just, just the fact that, that there is information on Twitter valuable enough for governments to have spies to look at is is, is I something said this on this show two years ago, Carsten, when I was here. I said the problem with these companies is that internally they have zero internal controls. They are not um, validating or doing any background checks on the employees that work for them. And once you're inside the company with a badge, you get full access to all but the data. Have, this was entirely but, predictable. But the problem is, is we have data breaches from people who have spent all their time doing this. It, it, the, the question is, is whether it's going to, you know, you know, we would think that our credit scores, or, you know, companies that manage our credit scores would have some control over the data. That, mm -hmm. that they, they have adults they're probably working there, but they still can't keep keep control of it. So the thing is, is that the that the issue is, is that assuming that they'd be able to actually fix this, you know, um, is is I think um, no, it would be difficult, you know, in that in that area. And again, I, what I will say is is that the um, the data control, you know, they are. I've been in a situation where I, you know, I I built up online forums, I built up all those things and the level of work when you're getting, especially when you're getting started, um, the, you are, yes, you can't fix everything. And then yep. the problem is you have a whole bunch of code. You have, you have an, you no, have a, I understand and, and, what you're and, saying, but you so also you're didn't have billions of dollars in profits but coming through the door every year. But that didn't happen until all that code was already written. This is in 2015. They yeah, should have been implementing this since 2000. Years. 11 years since they started. 11 years of code, of millions of lines a year. It doesn't matter. Now you're, they had the money, but you they have, had the capabilities, people were telling them it's a problem. I've been doing enterprise IT infrastructure and working inside of people's organizations for 30 years. There's a bunch of social this networks. This is well that, known and well understood. There was a bunch of social networks that thought that that was important. And you know what happened? They didn't succeed because they moved too slowly. And so the thing is, is that, that the, the problem is, is that these ones got bigger because they moved fast enough to stay in front of the wave instead of behind it. Now, the cost is now yep. that they have to go back and So don't and excuse try to tie them for the, being incompetent. They chose to be incompetent to put their users I, I don't, at risk. I, I wouldn't say they chose to be incompetent. I think they chose to move fast. You know, and I, I think, think that, if they could have made this an issue and fixed it at the beginning, like they would have. I mean, I'm just saying from the beginning, like I was on Twitter in 2006. It was not what it is now. I was the 103rd person to join Instagram. I was even on Bourbon, which was was like the thing that was before Instagram. And I, no one ever initially at these times ever expected it to be what it is. I'm not disregarding what you're saying that yes, these things need to be implemented. And I think now knowing this going forward, people starting companies and starting these types of apps with these things in mind, yes, it should 100% be implemented from the beginning. But I just think initially this was okay. such a whole new thing saying, that we were doing. I'm not saying it should have been implemented from the beginning. I'm saying by 2015, this should have been well under control. It's just, it's, it's, it's just when you have a, at, at that point, hundreds of millions of lines of code written by a lot of different people pulling pulling that out is like grabbing on you know it's, it's, it's like you know it's it's and it's not written by mm. uh you know it's it's not written by guys that are trying to build it in a structure they're trying to fix something today and so there's not a lot of you know good commenting there's not a lot of process yeah. and so so when we say that it's oh we should just go back in there and, and fix it 
You know, it's the same problem with, you know, uh, you know, like I'm just going to go back to it because I, it's very near and dear to my heart given sure. uh, is, is the fact that I lost power for four days because these idiots, you know, didn't put the power under the ground. Well, it cost them, you know, it's, they saved half a million dollars a mile to, to, to not put it under underground over the last 30 years. And now they're going to, they could have for the amount that it's going to cost them to mm -hmm. make that mistake, they could have put, put it under, under 60,000 out of the 82,000 miles. And so the thing is, is that, and, and again, when we talk about these kids and they're being irresponsible, this is a big company. You know, this yep. is of old people. You I've know, worked, and, and, I've worked and, and, for, and it's managed by the government. I've you know, worked so for the government is, departments. Is that, I've worked for the, but, the law. All these companies make mistakes. I've worked for you the know, government like law I'm departments. Not. I've worked for universities. I've worked for banking institutions. I've worked for online gaming companies. Mm -hmm. And I've worked for them when they're nascent and I've worked for them when they're mature. Mm -hmm. And there's a certain point at your cycle where you take data security seriously. Right. Neither Facebook, neither the Google, neither Twitter took this seriously until far too late in the cycle. They got behind on it, and and we're not, you know. But the thing is, is they're they are, yep. you know, it's it's. That's closing fine. Up. I have no problem with you know, them being behind. Let's just not make excuses for them. No, I'm just saying they, that that we have to be. They real are about incompetent. They made a mistake. Everybody. They maybe have fixed it by now, but Everybody. don't give them a pass and In, say, oh, I'm not you giving, guys made lots of money. Is a hard, hard, hard I'm not giving anybody a pass. Say. I'm just saying that everybody blows it. <laughs> like like you know, I I work with all. I work I I and and. And in full disclosure, I have worked with all of these companies. You know, like, you know, and yeah. the thing is, is that, but ev in the end of it, when you realize it, when you get into the middle of all of these things, whether it's governments or mm -hmm. big corporations or small companies or whatever, you realize that nobody really knows what they're doing. You know, like, you know, like they're all just trying yep. to figure it out, you know, and, and they're, some, some of them are making better decisions than others. Um, and the decision, they're, they're, there's good decisions and bad decisions, but, but let's, um, uh, so, but that's the, as far as we're going down the, the Twitter route and, and yet again, it is time for Leo to share some kind words with us. This week at Tech brought to you this week by Wasabi Hot Cloud Storage. My buddies, Jeff Flowers and David Friend, they were at Carbonite when they patented a process for writing to hard drives sequentially as opposed to in blocks. That made a big difference. In fact, it's why Wasabi, which is their new startup, it's enterprise-class cloud storage, hot cloud storage, is 80% cheaper and six times faster than S3. It's this patented technology. Only they have it. It also is more durable. 11 nines of durability. That's as high as you can get. Nine, 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 nine. 11 nines of durability. They do something else I think is so cool, especially in this day and age of ransomware. You can designate some of or all of your storage as immutable. It can't be changed, not by ransomware, not by fumble-fingered employees. That's awesome. Redundant data centers, too, so your data is never at risk. They do regular integrity checks to make sure your data has not been modified in any way. It is the best way to put your data in the cloud. And, you know, everybody's doing it. We're, they're all moving to the cloud. But you don't have to do what everybody else is doing. You don't have to follow the herd. I know, you know. Google, Microsoft, Amazon, everybody follows the herd. You don't have to. You don't have to. You can save money, get better performance. You don't have to tell them your secret is wasabi. By the way, just as secure, and I would say in most cases, more secure than on-premises storage. It's HIPAA compliant. It's FINRA compliant. It's CJS compliant. Look, just all you got to do is tell the boss, okay, I know you want the big three, but let me just tell you, I found one. That's 80% cheaper and up to six times faster than the better known brands. It's Wasabi. Calculate the savings for yourself and start a free trial. Unlimited storage for a month so you can really bang on it. Go to wasabi.com, W-A-S-A-B-I.com. Uh, click the free trial link, put the code in Twit, and then you'll get unlimited free storage for a month. Join the movement and migrate your data to the cloud with confidence. Wasabi.com. you got to use the offer code Twit. We thank Wasabi so much for their support. Now back to you. Justine, I have an important question for you. Yes. How do you like the new Facebook logo? Oh, gosh. <laughs> <laughs> it's fine. I mean, like, whatever. Like, if, I think at this point, I mean, it was kind of just a weird move that they're just like, all right. Well, isn't we're this, isn't this basically weird. like the alphabet, the kind of the alphabet Google thing is that you're trying it's to. It's extremely simple. But I mean, I think, you know, making all of their products kind of look the same. I, I get it. But 
the one thing that I never liked about Facebook is how many times am I going to have to download another app to do the same exact thing when I could just do it all in one app? I need the messages app. I need like the, the app so I can control my actual profile page. So I think, you know, just integrating everything into one app would be amazing. Um, but the logo is fine. Like if that's what you decided to go with. See, no, I think (laughs) that they, I think that they should have called it the Facebook (laughs) <laughs> like, like, that would if you're gonna go perfect, all caps you might no, as well go all the way but, right? but i mean like go back to their beginning you know mm. so the so the big holding yeah. company is the facebook and then you have facebook see mm. I, I just think that, that would be that would be perfect yeah. uh you know so yeah. but you know it, it is I, you know I, I like i have to admit that i like the different apps because for instance i don't you know necessarily want to go on facebook all the time but i use i have a lot of friends that are on messenger and so there's a lot of mm-hmm. you know back and forth and so i don't really want messenger when they split messenger mm-hmm. out, mm-hmm. I was like, I cannot believe they're doing that. You know, exactly. but, but then, but, but now I'm like, totally like, I'm really glad that I don't have mm-hmm. to, cause I think for me, a lot of times Facebook, I, I feel a little, um, uh, I feel that Facebook's a little heavy. You'll get and lost it, sort I of get lost in, in there. doing and something so, else instead of just making, just sending messages. Instead of just talking to somebody, mm-hmm. right, right. Yeah. It's, exactly. it's kind of, it's interesting. I was listening to a, 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 a professor of marketing, Professor Galloway, he's quite well known in the podcasting community. And he's, he points out that the whole idea of Instagram by Facebook and WeChat by Facebook, not WeChat, uh, what's the messenger called? Um, WhatsApp. WhatsApp by Facebook and Facebook by Facebook is really an interesting branding decision. And his point was with is how, do, how quickly can you destroy your company? Because um, the company that sits behind BMW cars also makes mini cars. So mm-hmm. if now all of a sudden you had Mini Cooper by BMW, that just destroys the whole branding exercise of BMW. Right, because no, I now, agree. I, I think that I, I, I don't. Think it's a, and he's making a point that it's a terrible mistake. I, I, I don't think you want to connect all the apps. No, I think you exactly. want the apps to be all their own little world, and and people who feel like they're using WhatsApp should just feel like they're using WhatsApp. WhatsApp. Unless you know. you're afraid the government's going to break you up, <laughs> in, well, in which case you have to tie everything together as quickly as possible to to make which, sure that which worked great for Microsoft. Yeah. yeah. That's exactly right. And it's just going to make it that much harder for Facebook to unpick it later and it'll be so much more painful and it'll probably destroy them like it did Microsoft, which is I'm very hopeful well, Instagram, yeah. they uh, broke out into their messages. It's, I think it's called like threads or something. So they broke out a separate thing for, for um, sending messages to like close friends. So I thought that was kind of interesting. But again, I'm just going to use the main app, I feel like. Yeah. I have to admit that I... I think I like it. I, I, I like it being on its own. I don't really message anybody on Instagram, so I don't think about. I mean, I'm, maybe I'm too old for that. But but I, I don't I, ever use Facebook anymore, so I think it's like I feel like we've all sort of moved to Instagram. Right. I just take we Instagram is like, like my, my friends. <laughs> my, the, my Instagram for me is is a is I'm traveling. Let me take some pictures for you. <laughs> you know, like, like, usually, like there'll be this like, like long desert of no yeah. no photos, and then it, and then it just pops up like here's a bunch of pictures of me in India or something like that. I don't that. have an Instagram account, so oh, I have the, the first thing I do every time a new social network comes out. I'm yeah. like, I got to get my name, so I always like register. So I yep. had I. Yep. It was like when I went to start using Instagram it was like years after it started and, and I and I was like, someone has my name? How did that happen? And then I realized that I yeah. had my No, I, I just gave name. up on Instagram. I couldn't make it work and uh, it was just too much of a time suck. And then I realized that uh, uh, most of my, uh, the the work that I do is in IT infrastructure. Mm-hmm. So, uh, the you know, servers, data centers, WANs, you know, infrastructure software and that sort of stuff. And I just realized that none of the nerds are on Instagram. None of the nerds are on Facebook. They're all on Twitter and LinkedIn and Slack groups. Right. So I don't care. Right. Right. Now, Facebook, of course, is still going to allow political ads and allow the politicians to lie. Mm. Um, is that something that we're concerned about, about them, about them lying? I mean, I'm more concerned for the people that are actually on Facebook and that are falling for these traps because, I mean, I know me personally, I'm not really, I don't use Facebook as much anymore, but I still use it to post updates like on my Facebook page and things like that. But it's it's hard because you'll see these ads and it is something that you are so fully believing is real and like, you know, the fake news aspect, whatever you want to, however you want to take that. I mean, most of it is fake. Like these ads that you're seeing, I have found myself in all of these fake ads holding up a product. They'll Photoshop out the phone that I have, which was like an iPhone or something and put in something fake. There's been all these ads that are running of me promoting a fake little NES system, but I'm actually showing the real one. So it's almost impossible to even stop that. And as soon as you report it to Facebook, another company will then 
make a new fake page and start running the same ad. So it is an issue even just for me. So I can't even imagine on the big scale of how this is just affecting people, especially the political nature. Mm -hmm. I think for me, it comes back to this issue we had further up the show where we talked about trust. If I can't trust Facebook to show me genuine content, and more importantly, if they're showing you content that they know to be false, then you can't trust Facebook as an institution. And where does that lead? And I think logically that ultimately it undermines. Now, Facebook is thinking that if you let that person show a false ad, that's not Facebook that gets the blame as the person showing the false ad. But I think the lesson is that from society is that that's not how it works. It's the platform that they blame or the platform that they trust. Well, I don't know if most society blames Facebook for anything. I don't know if they really think about it. You know, like we're that's, thinking about it. We're, we're talking yes. about it. I think most society is just like they yeah. just see the ads go by and they either believe them or not. Or, and, and, and I, I want to say, OK, is, Boomer right about now. But yeah, it's that age group who don't actually, they're so, they've had 50 or 60 years of just reading newspapers as a trusted news source where it's been, the platform has been controlled and regulated for not but necessarily that, but legally also, controlled, but controlled. And, I think and there's a middle group of people that are getting, that are impacted by these. I think that there's mm-hmm. a younger generation that is probably less, uh, <laughs> is, is more cynical yeah. about what, what's coming through. And I think that, I think that they're from a, I guess from my perspective, the question is, is should you believe anything that you see? Mm-hmm. You know, the, you know, <laughs> like whether it's on the probably news or not. whether it's on, on <laughs> Facebook or anything else. I, I, uh, you know, spent the last 20 years both in front and behind, you know, the press. And, you know, I, I need to see it from a couple of different angles before I'm going to believe anything that I see because, yeah, you know, of, everything is everything has got we, an agenda to it. But you we know, train and, and people to trust the news and then we've seen... Which is a horrible idea. Uh, the Ever. TV news. In and the history of the world. Well, it's historically, the news was always trustable, wrong. right? Never. To, to a large, Ever. lesser or greater degree. Never. And then we saw <laughs> Murdoch's monetize, like weaponize and monetize. The press was never trustable. Yeah. Like, let, let's be clear. Like, yeah. I'm not saying that they're lying. I'm not following up on some kind of Trumpism, yep. you know, like that is craziness. But what I'm saying is, is that it was never trustworthy because the, the there was people manipulating the person talking about it. There's the, yep. the, the person itself with their own, their own viewpoint. There's this, you know, I was in, but I was, was in. it was never malicious or deliberate. Oh yeah, it was. There, like, there was manipulation, oh, but yeah. it was the generally. Absolutely. The Spanish like, are, war to differ with you. Generally, it yeah, was yeah, balanced. Were, like, it wasn't awful, yeah. right? Like, oh, it is it was. now. It was like, completely compared awful. to what it is now, like, the, the weaponization Hearst. of like, the media. Like, they were so for, concerned about Hearst because he would change, yeah. he would push all these headlines and do all these other things. This is the, re, the reason that we, that we have all these laws about how much media you can have is because people were getting a lot of media and then lying with it. Yeah. You know, so, so, like, let's be clear that this is not, there's nothing, like, this is nothing new. And you have... People saying, I mean, like, if you think the press is crazy now, go back and look at the headlines around, like, the late 1850s and these newspapers. Oh, yes, and yeah, it's yeah. just crazy. You know, so so the thing is, is there's nothing new about this, you know? And so, just, Justine, are, 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 are you concerned about this? I mean, I'm concerned just for the nature of, you know, it is something that is being advertised to people. And do you believe what you see when you watch the news and, what, and when you watch Facebook? Do you believe what, what's showing up there? Well, like you said, I'll definitely go and look at separate sources. I will right. start searching on Twitter and then I will look and and it's crazy because you will just put these news articles next to each other and each one is different. Like the headline definitely skews to whatever that political belief is. So it's really hard and it's even hard to have your own opinions because everyone has so many differing opinions and this content that you're reading, it's being skewed towards what your beliefs are or something, you know, that it's like a trigger point because obviously Facebook knows everything. So if it knows or it's overheard the, me say something that I didn't like, it knows how to target that. The the problem is is that now the data the, the the data is getting so good. I mean the mm. the you know like TikTok is a good example of that for me is that TikTok will show me videos that I want to see but I don't want to admit that I want to see. <laughs> yeah. You know like like, I, like I'm like. No, yeah. of course I. I don't, I don't care about the that peanut video. butter of video. I might, yeah. I might watch that for another minute. Yeah. You know, like, you know, yeah. like or another, you know, ten seconds or whatever. I'm just gonna, for educational purposes, watch think, this one other another ten seconds. And so, but it's yeah. it's. I it's think, figured it out because it's watching me yeah. every second that I'm watching that video. It's making a decision about whether I like it or not. Yeah, I, th- I think that I think the interesting thing about, about the uh, political ads ultimately is that Facebook's getting paid to lie. And when people realize that, it gets really distasteful. It's one thing for people, because, for you and me to because, get onto Facebook okay, and say- Okay, but, but here's the question. You know, because broadcast ads that yeah. lie are different. Uh, because, because I just want to make sure we're all clear. Yes. That for Facebook, 
the political ads are some small percentage of their income. You know, that's well, not it's they not a big give part up of the, the ad but, revenue and but, not wouldn't but, even have to restate their financial results. It's right. so insignificant. So yes. so it's it's a tiny little number for them. But I can tell you for broadcasters, the election season is, is when they upgrade all their yeah. upgrade their studios, a, upgrade buy all the new cameras, buy all the like like there's just money coming in yeah. from heaven. It's, yeah. It is like it is like this this snow of money was, that comes into these broadcasters, and especially like, when it's when it's like. Trump has been this massive boom for the broadcasters yeah. because now they have it's it's snowing money every day. You know, like like it's not not just around the elections. It's just been crazy. Yeah, I, and so I'm trying all, to I mean, remember the numbers. And, it and was so like the thing is, is that is that it's it is when we talk about Facebook's getting paid to to lie. I mean, there's a lot of ads. You know, we can hmm. we can we can cover a lot of ads in the past twenty or thirty years where the broadcasters were getting paid to lie. I mean, those ads hmm. are are there and and. And I'm not saying that that's, I mean, I think that I, I, don't, I and, and what I will say, I don't know what the answer is. No. You know, like, like, as a, you know, I'm not going to say that they should just stop doing the ads like Twitter because the reality is. Well, Twitter is, didn't stop doing the ads. It said, we're going to stop accepting paid ads. So if a person, if a political, per, uh, if somebody standing in politics wants to get onto Twitter and make lies, then they do that as a person, but they can't pay to get that targeted I know the, and accelerated. And the problem is, is that, for for a, a incumbent, that's great. Yes, because because you already have a million followers, or you yeah. already have half a million followers, and now you have the startup that's going to mm -hmm. try to um, you know compete with you, and yep. they have to now they and the, and the problem. So yeah, is, you're is right. That, it opens up a, an opportunity for a new entrant to enter the market, but then it becomes an arms race where the new entrant needs to earn money to sustain a a uh, social media campaign, and the incumbent starts to spend money, and there's no winner here. The, the voters don't win because they're just spending more and more money on social media to put out more and more content that is supposed to attract ads. The only winner there is the social media company, all right? And in fact, what you end up with is what you have in politics around the world is as they spend more and more money on media, they have to raise more and more money. And the only way that you can move the needle on raising more money is to go to rich people and wealthy people. And as soon as you accept money from wealthy people, you, you get owned, Right, it's it's wealthy people don't give you money for altruistic reasons. They usually, over generally, give it to you so that they can own you and get a favor back. And that is the cycle that's being broken here by Twitter walking away from the money. It pulls out the accelerated cycle. Yeah, I, I think that the, the again the hard part. I understand. You know, again, I don't have I don't have an answer for it. But I think that that you know I've worked in a lot of campaigns where you're just trying to, especially when folks are trying to get off the ground. You know, how do you get that that word out mm. at the beginning? Now, I will say that I think that um, uh, I think that their earned views is gold. Like that is what everybody should be trying to figure out how to do. So I do believe that anybody who's just leaning on advertising, yeah. um, you know, is, is that's a, you know, kind of a cheap, the, cheap high. We're going through an election campaign in the UK and we're watching these 40, 50, 60 year old, political candidates do these off-the-cuff videos and it's gold. It's like watching your mum pretend that she's going to be all hip on an Instagram video. They mm. are just <laughs> appalling at it. I like, mean, well, it was the same, was the same mean, in 2018. I mean, it, watching the election, it, watching just, uh, political folks. Because there, there were a couple of folks that I yeah. we, we reached out to and just said, I'll help. Like, I'll yeah. just help you because yeah. I want to. And they're like, no, no, we got, it, we got it under control. And then you'd watch the videos and you were like, oh, oh. You know, like, like, you know, like, just yeah. it doesn't have to be that way, yeah, you know. And there's and, some like some somebody's holding up a camera, recording them, and you're looking. Look at the background. There's just, you know. Anyway, I'm sure, but it's just hysterical watching these people make the transition from, you know, they're literally walking down the street, door knocking at old station, old fashioned politics, mm -hmm. and then they stop to record a video, which is supposed to like. And I'm going like, why are you door knocking? Why are you not just doing social media? It just baffles me beyond belief. Anyway. Yeah, I mean, I think that the hard part right now is we got it, when we go back to the whole virtual. You know, what, why don't we have people working remotely because the the the, mm. the tools? I I will say I will argue that the the tools that we have right now to stream mm. um, to get out and, and interact with people, having meaningful conversations with a large number of people, are still rudimentary. Yeah, you know, like they are. Um, people love it and people get excited mm. about it and it's the way to scale your campaign and it's a way to scale your, your brand. But the tools, the tools that, that I've used for those things are stuff that we built from scratch. You know, we're, we didn't have, their, yeah. and they still are not, I figured once we did it, people would start building them all the time, but they haven't, you know, like, because so they don't understand the, it. So here's the other side of this too, is when Twitter said to 
that they're walking away from three million in revenue by ditching the political ads. Basically, they also de- walked away from having to develop a system that detected political ads and then detected the truth. And if you do the maths, three million dollars is roughly about three headcount in a machine learning in Silicon Valley, right? Because finding people with good math skills and math, machine learning skills. I just think that they just decided they didn't want to deal bucks. with it. I mean, you know, yeah. like it was just. I think that they just looked at it and said, you know, this is too hot. You know, and I think that like you know, the money it. that they're making three. They mm-hmm. said three million US is what they're taking for political ads. That's three headcount for Twitter in the machine learning team. Right? It's not even worth their while gearing up a team to try and detect fake ads because they can't. They can't win. Now, now so, Justine, do you think that that Facebook should allow the ads, or do you think they should just cut them off like everybody else? I don't think they would cut them off at all because I feel like that would be completely against everything that they basically stand for now, which is. I mean, their whole platform is built off of that type of promotion. And it's interesting that Twitter, they're, so they're only saying that they're losing $3 million by not that's taking all that, yeah. ads. I think the number would be much that's bigger. It. No, the number was $3 yeah, million. Yeah. Because that's not a lot at all. And like you were saying, the amount of money that that's it would That's the U.S. election paid. only. Yeah, Yeah, but it would, the amount of money it would have taken them to you know put those procedures in place to make sure that the ads were actually legit. It was real people. I mean, that would have cost, I would imagine, way more than that. Mm. So, I, I mean, I think it's a good deal, And but they've already given a massive platform to our current president to, you know, basically mm. say whatever he wants. So, he's still there. He's yep. still saying his piece. So, I think that's already way too much that they've already given him. Yeah. 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 <laughs> you know, and I th- and I think that that what you're talking about is the fundamental problem is you have incumbents who already have a large following, and how do you get how do you build up to where you can compete with that? And I do think that there are other solutions. I think that that people who care about this stuff need to become more organized. I think for the most part, what you see is a lot of disorganization. Mm. You know, where you know, for instance, if you can, you know. A lot of times what we work on a lot when we work on campaigns um, or what we do, used to, I don't, haven't done it for a while, yeah. <laughs> um, but is this kind of coordinated effort. So you're going to have thought leaders and influencers and all these things pushing towards a new thing. And, and again, what you're then doing is getting earned views, which is what you want to try to try to build up. It's going to be a lot more valuable, you know, in the, in the long run. More impactful. And, yeah. and, and the, but, the, but the hard part is, is that I, I do think that it's, it's a um, it's a complicated problem. You know, like I, I look at it, I go, oh, I'm glad I'm not the guy that has to figure, has, has to make this decision. All right, so we're going to talk about. We're actually going to get out of the security conversation, <laughs> jump into graphics next. But Leo has a couple words that he needs to share with us. Our show today brought to you by Captera. Find the right tools to make an informed software decision for your business. Captera is the leading free free online resource. That'll help you find the best software solution for your business. If you dream of being more productive, save time and upgrade the way you work with the right software. Explore software. Narrow down your favorite options in minutes. Use the software guides, the comparison tools at captera.com slash twit. Start making your work be less work and find the right software for your business at captera.com slash twit. You know what the best part is? One million plus reviews of products from real software users so you'll get every bit of information you need to make the right choice by the way these reviews they're all validated you can be confident read the reviews there's a thousand new reviews every single day at captera.com slash twit and if you want to help you don't have to pay there's no it's free but you could leave a review pay it forward a little bit Help Captera continue to be the leading free online resource for software solutions. 700 specific categories of software. Everything from digital workplace software to video management software. No matter what kind of, of, of programs, of apps your business uses, Captera makes it easy to discover the right one fast. And you know why? Because they believe software makes the world a better place. Because software can help every organization become a better version of itself. Join the millions of people who use Captera every month to find the right tools for your business. Did I mention it's free? Not freemium. Free. They'll never ask you for a penny. Just a review. And I, so that's me asking. I think it's a good idea. Captera.com slash twit. Try it free today to find the tools you need to make an informed decision for your business. Captera.com slash twit. C-A-P-T-E-R-R-A dot com slash twit. Captera is software selection simplified. 
and we love it. Thank you for your support of Twit, by the way, Captera. Thank you for supporting Twit by going to captera.com slash twit. Try it. It's free. What do you got to lose? Now back to the show. Justine, did you get the new Photoshop for iPad? I did. What yeah. do you think? I'm actually really looking forward to this. I was reading a bunch of the reviews and everyone said, but you guys didn't put all of the features into it. And, and they're, you know, obviously like we can't put all those years of, of uh, work and code into the iPad app. But for what it is right now, I am always making thumbnails. I'm always doing a ton of photo editing. And the way that it can sync, you know, using the cloud services, I can be cutting something out using the Apple Pencil, go and just drop it into my actual Photoshop on my computer and continue working. So for me, it's been incredibly seamless. And just being able to, you know, make simple thumbnails and then upload them on YouTube when I'm traveling is really great. So I'm excited about the future of Photoshop and all the Adobe products for for uh, mobile. Because even like Adobe Rush, I'm a huge fan of for editing videos. It's been great. And do you use Spark? I have used it a little bit, but now, I mean, I mostly was using Adobe Rush and mm -hmm. I'm just waiting for Final Cut to be able to, or iMovie actually, to be able to edit vertical video. It's still <laughs> shocking that they have not put that in yet. I am. It, it blows my mind. You know, uh, I was so against it like so against nine by 16 uh -huh. and we had clients that would ask us to like, what do you think of nine by 16? I was like, not that much. And like, <laughs> I don't, you know, like I was like, I don't, I, I hate it, you know? And, and here's the worst part is that, you know, I did a bunch of consulting for um, some TikTok stuff. So I spent a lot of time in TikTok and now you get into this thing. Like on, if you're on TikTok and you see a 16 by nine, you immediately just go, Nope, Nope. I'm just not even going to, I don't even, I don't care what you're saying in a 16 by yeah. nine. And even one by one, you're like, uh, you're cross you're, you're cross posting this to Instagram, aren't you? You know, like and, and you kind of like you look at them sideways, like you're not really a TikToker, <laughs> you know, like you know, like you know, like you just you're, you're cheating. And so, um, so the nine by sixteen, and my frustration is, is that more tools aren't built around nine by sixteen. Which uh, there's people who are probably listening to the show that are probably horrified that I that it, that came out of my mouth. Mm -hmm. Um, I but, was against it for a very long time. And now I love editing vertical video and it is a challenge. Like even now I've like moved my camera back a little bit more like at my desk setup so that I can still have enough space on each side to edit that piece into a vertical video. So I don't have to reshoot things twice. I've also sometimes been using my phone or two separate phones and like just attaching them together and shooting vertical and horizontal at the same time. So it's, it's been a challenge, but I mean, there's one of the um, another... Go ahead. There's Go ahead. another app. Have you seen Firework at all? I haven't used it very much, but it's kind of cool because you can it you can hold the camera horizontal, but then also vertical, and it kind of gives you sort of a, a flipped feel of the whole image in the video. But I enjoy editing vertical video now a lot. I think that there's, especially when you're it's a person talking to a bunch of other people, it, re it works really well. So that mm -hmm. there's something that's more personal about the, seven, the nine by 16, and this took me a long time to get to. Um, it, it is that I think that when it's a person, mm. it that's kind of a nice frame. When it's there's a reason two people why it's or three called people. portrait, exactly, and landscape, exactly. And so, so in a, as a portrait, I think it works actually pretty well. Um, I think that it is uh, as a when you're trying to have two or three people or trying to show something wide. Like, I, and I'm always surprised that watching landscape quote unquote stuff on on something like TikTok where they're they're showing like a big old panorama and it excuse me and it works mm. you know so so it's an so does it mean that TikTok then tends to lean into head to toe shots of people no doing not head to toe just just for just nine by 16 so it can be there it can yeah, be but just what I'm saying chest, is, is chest to over their head I could imagine that if you're shooting this is not my area of expertise so I'm coming mm -hmm. in as an outsider um, if you're if you're shooting vertically, you're going to lean into seeing the person, or you're going to see torso to head. Mm -hmm. Whereas if you're shooting right, sixteen so by torso. nine, you're going to get shoulders and head. Right. But it allows you when you're shooting portrait, and let's just say torso to head, it's much more focused on that person because when you shot, if it's one person talking yep. to you, there's a whole bunch of stuff behind them. Yeah, that's what worry. I'm saying. Yeah, they have to worry about their background and they have to worry about a bunch of other things. So does that to. focus on vertical then? And maybe Justine's the right person to ask. Does it make it focus on the person instead of the scene? 
It is, I think, a lot more personal, but a lot of that stuff is also shot using like the front facing camera. Uh, and it also provides, I mean, even me as like editing a vertical video, like how can I fit other things into this frame? So if I'm doing like an unboxing video, I can put my expression at the top, I can do a split screen and put the product at the bottom. So it's just trying to find like other interesting ways to kind of take that existing content and re-edit it into something that's vertical is it's challenging, but it's also really fun. But I do feel like the vertical video is way more personal. Yeah. Yeah. So it's, it's an interesting, um, process that Apple is a little behind on, I think, you know, as far as it doesn't make sense. Like you guys basically created this monster. Now give us the tools to edit it. But yeah, that's definitely (laughs) something that, that I've been pushing for. It's like you have iMovie, which works incredible. Um, but Adobe rush is, is my go-to now for, for editing any vertical stuff. And then, um, I think it's a Luma touch. The Luma fusion is also really great for editing. It's basically like final cut, just, in a mobile do you like Luma Touch? version of it. I do. Yeah. I mean, I've mostly just used Rush for simple things. Mm-hmm. And then I always usually have my computer with me. So if I actually have to edit something, I just hop into Final Cut. And are you using, are you doing vertical video in Final Cut? Mm-hmm. Yeah. And I do does, a lot of vertical video. How does that work for you? Does it, does it, does it work well? It does. Yeah. yeah. I mean, I just I guess kind of Final Cut doesn't really care. It doesn't. No. And I'll usually take my existing like 16 by nine project and just copy and paste it into an, um, into like a vertical format and then just kind of adjust each piece and kind of just make it work. But, uh, yeah, it, I think I'm not sure. I don't really use, uh, premiere very often, but I think they were working on some things that will auto adjust your previous project and kind of reformat it into vertical. So I'm not hundred percent sure if that's, I think that's what they announced not too long ago. I think that's kind of like AI editing. And it's one of the reasons that I got like the 6K from, you know, the Blackmagic 6K was because it, if you shoot 6K, then you can do whatever you want. You know, like, like it's not, you know, I don't, I don't have to think about whether it's vertical or not. It's horizontal. There's like tons of resolution to work inside of there. So you can kind of move your frame around and just kind of get whatever you, you know, kind of use it and repurpose it, you know, so just throwing more bits at it. I, I want to ask you a question, Justine. Um, I've had a lot of uh, people tell me that they're giving up on Adobe's licensing because the cost of subscribing to Adobe's product is getting... Uh, higher and higher, and people are turning away. Uh, there was an article in Slash dot this oh, and, week, and the and the reviews for the iPad one have just been crushed by people that are upset about the subscription service. I mean, so like you got to pay extra for the iPad version. Well, the iPad version, you have to have a subscription. No, it, you it, just have to have a sub- subscription. You already have to have a Photoshop subscription yeah. to use the iPad version. Is that right, Justine? I think so. Yeah, I mean, I have yeah. a subscription. I do so too, so I, I didn't notice it. Didn't yeah. have a problem. Yeah, I mean, I think. I just remember growing up, like when I was really young, I was like, I can't, like, there's no way my mom is going to pay, you know, thousands and thousands of dollars for each of this piece of software and then for updates. Mm -hmm. So I think, you know, just having that subscription fee and especially if you are a business, like you're basically building your entire life off of this product. So, Mm -hmm. I mean, I think it makes sense. I'm not sure if they have smaller subscription plans, if you just plan to use Photoshop, but I have the whole whole package. They have a $10, uh, Photo, uh, photography mm. subscription that has Lightroom. And does that include Lightroom it also? It includes uh, Photoshop, Lightroom, and Photoshop for the iPad. Mm. Right, I think that's actually really good yeah. if you think about it. I mean, that's $10, $10 a month. $10 a month, it, 120 a year for those apps. That sounds like three times more than I would pay for it. Like, I can get... Well, I think the problem is is that there are a lot of tools in Photoshop that just still aren't in uh, Pixelmator or Affinity mm. or, yeah. you know, like other ones. So you think that you want to use them. And I... I've been trying to move more of the work, you know, um, like for instance, we had for a long time, like a lot of our computers would have, everybody had Pixelmator mm-hmm. and then the people doing graphics had Photoshop, Yep. you know, like, but, but the, you know, so you, you were able to edit stuff and then, and then I use affinity beca- on some stuff now because, um, for, for 360, uh, video yep. and for 360 stills, uh, affinity has a three, a, 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 a um, panoramic view where you can look straight down at your tripod and paint it out really easily, which is that's cool. Su- super useful. So, uh, <laughs> so anyway, um, uh, so, so that was, you know, why I kind of got into that. And so I love those apps. And I think that the hard part is they don't want to just copy all the things that, that Photoshop did They're doing but something for else. us, yeah. you know, and, and unfortunately, I mean, I remember when Photoshop added layers. So, you know, like I'm old enough to, you know, like it was a, been using this for a long time and it's hard for me to, like, I just can't figure out why, you know, yeah. where it is. I'm not saying that Pixelmator and Affinity doesn't do it. I just don't know where it, where that it's thing is. It's and, interesting for me. And they do goofy things with alpha channels and layers that I that drive me a little crazy. Uh, see, for me, I've looked at buying... What were you going to say, Justine? Well, no, just like a lot of these apps, I think people don't even realize that they're even paying for. I mean, just these simple iPhone apps, 
you have to pay several dollars a month to unlock. So this is not something that's that uncommon. I think maybe people might be overreacting a little bit. And I mean, I definitely remember this was when I first started using Photoshop as well. I mean, it was thousands of dollars. And obviously, I mean, I think they have student pricing for things as well. But I mean, if this is something that you're using on a daily basis and you're using it for business, I mean, I, I think the $10 a month is well spent using a product that actually does work and you have the cloud and everything can just sync well together. You are taking a risk. I mean, in the, in, back in the day when we were, when we were spending $600 on a, or $700 on a uh, copy of Photoshop, then you were taking a risk that are you going to use it enough yes. you know, to make that work? And so a lot of us, I mean, I started obviously with an unofficial copy. It's kind of, you know, how, how most of us started well. in the nineties. What? Yeah. I did as well. And I think every 30 days, because I was in sixth grade at the time. So like I didn't understand this whole world or my parents didn't really understand it. So every 30 days I would reformat my computer. And back then we had floppy disks. So I was like trying to copy all of my little files onto here. I'm like 11. I'm like, I don't know what I'm doing. <laughs> but every 30 days I would reformat so I could have yeah. fireworks and Photoshop. And it was, I don't know. These and kids didn't even, today we didn't even- just- it wasn't even that hard when I was when I started doing it. It was yeah. just a it, it, you just you just had to get somebody's discs and usually you know or a copy of their discs and you needed the the serial number and then, then you were kind of like you're in you yeah. know like and 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 you you uh, and and it was it was easy um, to do that. Of course, Photoshop. I mean, Adobe figured out how to tighten it. And and as soon as here's the reality: as soon as I started making money, I bought it because I don't want to I don't want to get caught with illegal software. So you know, by the mid '90s, I was paying for it. And yeah. the great thing about Photoshop is it came with a scanner. So it came with every scanner yeah, that you yep, could yep. buy in the early nineties. And so that was the, that was the big thing was that we just, you would just buy a scanner, <laughs> buy a scanner and that's where the Photoshop <laughs> would show up and you, everybody had a legal copy because they bought a scanner. Yeah. I just, I, that's I, amazing. I, I struggle with Adobe. I just can't get on board. Um, because the, the, even starting Photoshop, the whole interface is baffling to me. I can't make sense of it. You can't make sense of the of Photoshop. No. Well, I think it's hard. You know, I, I had actually, just, I had a conversation, you know, um, uh, with someone who worked on the original Photoshop and, um, and, you know, his, his point was strong was that, you know, for us, when I started, it was very, uh, it was very simple. It was, yeah. it was less, much, much less than what Pixelmator does yeah. or, or other things like that. And then they just kept on adding little features. And so it wasn't baffling to me because they just kept on adding yeah, you've been the new through things. It and so I just, I didn't have to learn how to do something from scratch. Mm-hmm. And, and yeah, and to the point that someone's making online, PS uh, Photoshop Elements does, you know, a much more simplified version of the experience. Um, although for me, as a, as a user that's used it in production for a long time, it's too simplified and I can't, I can't, I don't feel like I can get everything done. Yeah. And so, but I think that, I think that for the, for most people doing photo editing, I think Photoshop is a little bit of overkill. Um, I think that most people, uh, a Pixelmator or an Infinity would work great. And I think if you didn't have that history, I think it would be less. But for people like us who have been using it, Justine, since you were 11, me yeah. since I was yeah. 21 or 22 yeah, I mean, years old, it's just it's really hard. I've been to, using for decades, which I wouldn't, you know, I just couldn't recommend to normal people because the right. gap is just too large. But Adobe for me is just getting into Adobe is so tough. It's so expensive. Like, just it's it's hundreds of dollars a year and I'm just going like I would rather go and buy a license for Sketch or you know one of the other services that's a fraction of the price and it's just, I, it's I just a, not, it's a fraction of features too it, like I mean I'm using it every day on a daily basis right. for hours and hours on end so I think you mm-hmm. know it, it it comes down to it like do I need this or, or do I not need this yeah. and for me it, I, like I definitely obviously need it and it still is incredible that Final Cut is Three hundred dollars. We've once. bought that once. Like yes. that's it. So that's super and that's the impressive. benchmark for me is that I think that Adobe might be is certainly leaning into its customers f- by charging so much money. And I just find I just it don't know very, if they're leaning. I, I you know I just I don't know if they're sure. leaning. But they have I don't know if they're so much stuff. They have I mean Premiere, After Effects. I mean, you have everything. Illustrator, InDesign. So it's like I use that whole suite of things, okay. and it's all there and, under and subscription. So like that would have cost, I mean, thousands of dollars. Like back in the day, even now, if you were to buy it, also the subscription model, I absolutely love it. And again, yeah. if it isn't something that you need, you can just choose to yeah. stop the subscription. And so if that's you're not always a professional. Good. It doesn't make sense. But if you are like for a professional to even have the whole suite, you're talking about an hour maybe an hour or two of, of your billable hours mm-hmm. pays for it for that month. Yeah. You know, so out of I think of it's the, like $50 a month. Yeah, like 50 bucks a month. So, so yeah. 
you know, depending on how much you're making, that's anywhere from 15 minutes to, to a couple hours, yeah. you know, of, of, of uh, you know, is your rent out of 160, you know, hours of, of time. So, so I think that for the, if you're, if you're a professional and this is what you're doing all the time, I think that makes sense. Now, yeah. all, Adobe also released Arrow. Uh, Justine, have you played with Arrow at all? I have not yet. No. Yeah. It's, it's something that um, I'm excited about. I haven't played with it a ton. Um, but I'm excited about where it's going. One of the things I'm really excited about is that it is supporting the new USDZ uh, format, which is going to be, or it's going to be supporting the USDZ format. The USDZ format is a, it's, I believe it is the uni, uh, universal scene description. U USD was a, um, a Pixar format and USDZ is, it zipped. <laughs> so zipped up so it's a little bit more, con you know, contained. Mm -hmm. um, and, uh, but that's, Apple's been really pushing that format forward. And I'm really excited about, you know, seeing USDZ in more places. I really wish it was in um, Keynote. But, um, but you know, like that's, that's my dream is the, uh, the Apple office stuff supporting it so that I can drop 3D models and stuff, you know. And, <laughs> but it means that you have a simple way to, um, uh, you know, basically export models. And, then, and, and the idea is to get to a point where designers can build AR experiences, um, you know, relatively easily. I think that, you know, I think that this is a good one. I think that Apple's um, reality creator, I think it's reality creator. I don't have it right in front of me, but um, is another great one where it's, you know, making a much more graphical interface because I think that's going to be needed for AR. You know, it can't be all like, I'm going to write, for most of the AR stuff we've done, there's a lot of, a lot of lines of code that make it work. <laughs> you know, like it's, yeah. you know, it's not, it's, it's not, it's not like, it's like yeah. we built a bunch of cool pictures and now we're going to write, a, you know, somebody's <laughs> going to write a bunch of code to make it work. Um, yeah. I mean, do you, Justine, do you see yourself um, building AR experiences and stuff like this? I think so. I mean, I definitely would love to mess with it more. It's just, you know, right now it's like, okay, how much time do I need to dedicate to just keeping YouTube going? And then, you know, how much time do I dedicate to all of these experimental things, which may never end up anywhere. But I always love testing out things like this. So, um, yeah, I'm definitely interested in the whole future of AR, like especially AR experiences for other people. So imagine me sitting on the couch with somebody watching one of my YouTube videos that's up on the, an imaginary TV. So they could just be holding their phone, watching on an imaginary AR TV that's there. They could turn to me. I can give them some feedback, be like, oh, I love this part. Like this is, make sure you pay attention. So I think there's a lot of really cool things that can be done in the future with that. Yeah, I'm I, I'm really focused on education in in relationship to it. Is just that you know, or not just. And when I say education, I don't mean K through twelve or or secondary, but mm -hmm. but really the idea of you know, I'm walking through, let's say, a historical location and being able to pick up my phone and be able to see new data. You know, like this That's is what cool. this was, and this is what this was, or this is what this used to look like, or yeah. this is you know, these are all the things that that you could be adding to the adding to that experience where. Uh, as a as a venue, um, you know, someone who's got the venue, whether that's a historical venue or anything else. Like for me, like AR, someone, I, I saw something, I guess, that they're doing a bunch of stuff and the, the Dallas Cowboys are really way ahead of this. Yeah. And they have this big thing where the football players are really huge and everything else. And I was like, I just want to know where to go to the bathroom. Like, like, <laughs> yeah. like, like I just want to pick up my phone. Like, I just the number want to hold one, my phone one down feature, here and have an arrow that the number goes faster. No, I want to pick up the phone and I want to see an arrow that goes like this. You know, like that goes down yeah. and around and I go, okay, that's where I'm, that's where I go. You know, or, yeah. I want, or where do I that's pick great. up the hot dogs yeah. or, you know, like I, I like if you just gave me that, I'd be really happy. I mean, you know, you know about because you get to these huge arenas and you can't figure out yeah. which way is up. <laughs> anyway, so um, we'll see how that goes. Now, Microsoft had Ignite. Um, they have one of the things that uh, we're looking at here is their strategy of Azure Arc, Azure Stack Hub, Azure Stack Edge. Can you tell us a little <laughs> bit about what all this stuff? I is? can try. We're going to drop into some consulto babble, though. So we're going to start talking about uh, right. when you start talking about UCSDs. I'm sort of losing it. But uh, USD up until now, Microsoft has been <laughs> working with Azure Stack on premise, so that yeah. in your own data center, right. and you would have, and that would be an on ramp to the Azure Cloud. And mm -hmm. so it's the old Hyper V. You've got a group of contain uh, of the virtual machines, and on top of it is a controller that drives the virtual machine. So mm -hmm. it brings your storage and your servers and your networking all together ish right. sort of thing. And that's your first step down the road to cloud is to get into virtualization, and then you could take those virtual machines into the cloud. The second stage of cloud uh, infrastructure has been to transition to containers. And so we've seen the, the idea of a container where a virtual machine will run containers inside of that on top of the server. And then it becomes where does the control plane for the containers sit? So the announcement that Microsoft is saying 
is very similar to what Google Anthos has done and mm. similar to what AWS Outpost has done, which are the competitor products, which is instead of putting the control plane in your data center, mm. use the one in the cloud. And then Azure Stack in the cloud will then manage all of the containers in the VMs, whether they're in Azure's cloud, whether they're in your Azure Stack on-prem. So it That's just becomes very seamless. Uh, it's an attempt well, to be theory, seamless. Theory, in theory. In theory, it becomes seamless. And what it also does is it becomes cloud first. So right. where the previous generation of Azure Stack was in my data center, lots of servers, VMs, and then I can start moving those VMs into the cloud but there's a control where that passes out of my domain into Azure's domain. Mm -hmm. Now the control stack is in Azure for containers, for the VMs, and it shifts people's thinking away from on-prem to cloud first, right. which is good for the Azure well, business. And I think that what's interesting is I know that for, with AWS, we're doing a bunch of stuff right now where I, I have uh, this thing I was talking about has 343 you know, million polygons. Well, yeah. I tried to texture it and it crashed. You know, it didn't crash yes. my, well, it did crash my computer. It was, yes. my, my little iMac was like, I can't do this. You know, like <laughs> I'm not built for this. You know, this is too much. And and so, so we, you know, I'm going to, then I put it on my PC and it was still not enough RAM. Yep. You know, so now I'm just getting, you know, but the idea that I was talking to a friend of mine, he was, we'll just spin up a, you know, so in AWS, we're spinning up. GPU clusters. Two, I got four GPUs and a, and a, mm -hmm. um, and a 256 megs of RAM with a big, you know, like whatever. I'm just, I just spin that up and just push everything there and let it cook. Mm -hmm. And I'm paying like our subscription that we were just talking yes. about, except a little bit more, you know, like, so I think it's like 30 or $40 a day or something like that. But the thing just, you know, Still but I was able to just create. Because I don't need that computer. That's an expensive. Yeah, you don't want to spend $100,000 or whatever. That's a lot of computer, and it's like yeah. ten or twenty, thirty thousand dollar computer that's, put it that's in sitting a, there. And then you got to put it somewhere. You got to power it. It's probably drawing three or four kilowatts. Exactly. So instead, go, I just yeah. throw it into that. You know, I'm able to just kind of push it into the cloud and let it do its thing for the time that I yep. um, that I need it, and then I'm and then yep. I'm out. So now, Justine, do you see yourself moving into the cloud? How much How much work do you do in the cloud right now? I mean, I do a lot as far as uh, transferring huge files back and forth for editing. I mean, we use Frame.io a lot for almost all the editing stuff as far as, you know, making changes and edits and sharing things with clients. But I'm interested in like cloud computing. So what Google's doing with Stadia is pretty fascinating. Just the fact that you can play all of these crazy, massive, uh, powerful games just in the palm of your hand is going to be really cool. So I think for me, cloud computing is going to be really cool. Uh, so that's going to be something that I'm definitely looking forward to checking out. Mm. And I agree. I agree that with Frame.io, that's pretty much how we, that's how you communicate with everybody, you know, to tie, yeah. you know, tie all that stuff together. It's a great example of, you know, how cloud as a, as a service, you know, really makes sense for, yeah. you know, for a lot of folks. It can. Yeah, and it's able to integrate directly in with Final Cut. So it's, you know, they're using, um, or Premiere, you know, or, yeah, or Premiere, or a variety of yeah. things. Like it's, it does, it does, it covers so, yeah. kind of all the bases there. So yeah, I think just the cloud is, is going to be great. It's yeah. just the hard part is, you know, when I'm traveling, you know, the Wi-Fi in hotels sometimes isn't that great, or when I'm visiting right. my parents. So it's having that consistency yeah. of connection is going to be really, really important. Well, like that—that that was my trouble with this 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 thing that I'm working on is I, uh, you know, when I was traveling, it was hard to put the the files onto the virtual machine because. It's you know six gigs of photos. Yes. You know so so you're like there's there's a start process. Yeah, that six, is take transferring six gigs into the cloud is a substantial challenge. But uh, and that that problem probably won't ever go away. So the network infrastructure that's in the world today is not iterating at a pace that we need to manage big pieces of data moving around. Networking is particularly weird. in short term. Like I mean, what what I mean by that is if I have to have it done right now, that's a problem. If I yeah. if I can, you know, the the hard part really is making sure that the tools allow me to um, interrupt yep. that up upload. Yeah, uh, and, and then resume and it, resume it, it. Yeah, relatively well. Yeah, you know, like that's always the problem. Is well, this is, is the problem because um, I'm glad you mentioned Stadia, uh, Justine, because it's really interesting. Because my general vision of Stadia is that it's probably ten years away. So don't mm. get too excited about it. It needs, I think, last time I checked, it needs roughly 50 megabits per second of consistent bandwidth to operate to bring the image down at, say, 2K, 4K type mm -hmm. thing. And there's just not that much bandwidth in the world. And in, it's entirely possible, according to some of the people I've spoken to, that there's actually not that much compute in Google's cloud to be able to do that yet. So it's a very exciting project, but it's very early announced. It's not actually there. Mm. They don't have GPUs in all of their locations. So it might work around Silicon Valley or close to where their cloud infrastructure is, but if you're outside of that range, yeah. but in a lot of ways. They've already, they've already said that, that not everyone who has ordered it will be able to play it day yes. one. 
which is really sad. But I mean, I think it's just great that, you know, getting that sort of early adopter, you know, the products is I think yeah. really what a lot of us fall into, yeah. but it just makes me more excited for the future. Like even getting a camera today, I'm like, this is great, but this makes me more excited for what we're going to see next. Yeah. So well, I'm, I'm the person in the infrastructure who's sitting there going like, we don't have the infrastructure to make this happen. And I actually kind of think that the other side of that coin is it makes very little sense to announce these products, which are so obviously not fit for consumption. And then people try them and they get unhappy with them and then they fail. Would they be better? It's the same thing with, you know, like 5G, you know, 5G, everyone's so hyped about 5G and you're all going to be let down when it's barely even usable or in your area. Or or you you do something where it calls 5GE. Oh, God, yeah, AT&T. What are you doing? Well, the the worst part is, is that the worst pieces that it's not just marketing. You wish it was mar- yeah. just marketing, but they are switching something because my performance drops when it goes to 5GE. Yeah. Like, and I'm just like, okay, if, if you were going to do the the absolute wrong thing, yeah. it is it is make sure that it's my my experience is worse when you switch to the new brand. So what actually happens the is there's a, I don't know if you're interested in this, but um, there's a thing called four and a half G, mm-hmm. which is so 4G LTE. And then right. inside the LTE is a lot thing called LTE um, plus or an LTE mm-hmm. extra mode, which is sort of broadly named 4.5G, mm-hmm. and it's a it activates a bunch of extra frequencies and right. signaling rates, and you know the usual sort of, you know, the the, the way that the 3G 4G standards work is the right. first 3G comes out, right. and then there's all these sub releases that we don't talk about, you know, and um, and then 4 comes out, and it's a major mm-hmm. step. It's right. actually not even, well, 4G was a ma- 5G is a major step because they stop encoding the IP into um, radio packets, mm-hmm. IP actually becomes native on the network. So the data right. flow becomes vastly improved and much better. So five true 5G will be a difference. What happened with AT&T was they relabeled 4.5G 5G. Right. Right. Which they did the, they did the last time too. I mean, they, mm. they had whatever they called it. Yeah. But it was like they, the AT&T has, has a yeah, habit uh, of jumping. Habit of like, I want to be first and I don't actually want to put the hardware out there or we're, we're working so on it. So there's no phone. We're going to get you excited. There's only like one phone in the country, anywhere right. in the world that can do 5G. Um, you shouldn't buy it because it only does it on a certain subset of frequencies mm-hmm. that will be never work very well. You'll never get good 5G. So as long as you're willing to take that 5G phone and throw it in the bin in about six months when the next generation If you want to be the cool rolls, kid on campus that has yeah. 5G that, that gets to say, yeah. I got 5G and it's so fast and everything's yeah. great. Well, it's perfect. It's perfect for That's you. assuming you actually have a 5G tower. Because you've got well, to be You're going to be standing this. within yeah. five feet of the tower. Yeah, exactly. Or it's gonna yeah. But you it's going to be very impressive in that, one, yeah. in that one little bit. I, and, I have hey been guys, that person. Hey, guys, meet me at the 5G tower. We can download some files. Like, <laughs> exactly, because you've got to be like within like 250 feet of it. So it's, yeah. it's, it's going to be... Yeah. But re- now the 5G though, I mean, I can see the transmitters getting put up even in like the little town that I live in. Um, you see the little dots going on all the lights and mm-hmm. you know everything else. So there, it's you know it won't be just one tower. It'll be like these little groups of areas. There's where a lot of investing. incentives for the telcos to get into 5G. Mainly, it's to do with the software control of the tower. So they're shifting away from the legacy idea of hardware, custom hardware, custom specifics, to using software defined radios and software defined engines in the, right, right, right. the tower. And so that dramatically shifts the way the cost... Well, doesn't it all... It also allows them to compete with uh, terrestrial cable, right? I mean, like, because you you theoretically could be now, you know, like a, a T-Mobile can be competing with a Comcast because I mean, if they can keep that price down, if they can, get, if they can match the same price for that... You know, I, I now theoretically have a choice of that 5G distribution yes. over top of instead of using except, the ones that are, have had the lock. Except that substandard is still in the 3 GPP forums and is probably three to five years away before it'll be ratified. Mm-hmm. And then you have to have the spectrum licenses. So you have to go out and buy the spectrum licenses from the government that you can run the, the that in. And then you have to have a base station that you put in on your house that it lets you to do that. So right. there's a lot of steps in the middle of that. Yes, it is potentially exciting. Um, however, the idea that you'll be able to get a gigabit per second is fraught with all sorts of really substantial well, infrastructure I, I think challenges. I think, I think mostly the average person wouldn't notice anything. Yes. If, if they had 100 down and... and 20 up, they'd yep. be like, well, oh, this is amazing. Yep. You know, like, like it's not, like it's not, you know, until 8K comes out as, as Justine, Justine, when, have you seen actually any true 8K content on your 8K TV? Um, they did have some 8K content that was like available that I could watch on it. But as far as. Was it just, like a butterfly? 
Yeah, it was mostly like nature. Yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah. It's like, like, it's, it looks amazing. But yeah. I mean, I again, I watch a lot of my content on my phone. So, you know, 8K content for me on my phone is going to be, it's it's not that necessary. <laughs> you know, I was like, I, <laughs> I, I think But even Sony... looking at like my analytics and stuff like on YouTube, it's like most people watch content on the phones, at least my audience. Right. I, I was kind of poo-pooing 8K until I was at NAB and they showed Sony the Sony booth. They should just, I, I have no idea why Sony doesn't show this at like Best Buy and so on mm. and so forth. But they had a they had this giant LED wall that was 8K HDR, 120 frames a second. Mm -hmm. And it literally made me sick. No, <laughs> no, sorry, no, like, like, because when they moved the camera, my, I realized that my brain could no longer process the difference between reality and what it was looking at. Yeah. And so it was like, you're moving the camera, but I'm not moving. You know, like, so my inner ear and my, and my eye suddenly... Just the same problem that you have with VR, yep. except mm -hmm. I was looking at a screen. It was only happened when I walked close enough to the screen where it, you know, got my whole periphery mm. that it became this problem. But I realized that that is the, but of course that, and I think that that is where we settle. I think that 100, 8K, 120 frame per second uh, HDR is where we'll get to that point and then we're not going to really, other than crazy yeah. things it won't get any further than that well and like the the lg of tvs so i have like one of those like in my office and it's so crazy because it's right next to two windows so it's in the middle and when you put like a fake window on it you can't even tell that it's not like it's a tv like it just looks <laughs> like there's a window in the middle of my window so it's it's like things are getting so realistic that you know when people talk about like video games and things like that like i mean you are actually living in these worlds now and it's 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 crazy mm. And it'll be interesting. I, I really wanted to see, uh, I don't think I'm going to end up getting to see it in at, at one of the Dolby theaters, but the, the new um, Will Smith movie had uh, it, they were, they did it in 4k 120 mm. frame per second. Um, and I really wanted to see it in, in high frame rate, but um, oh, it's not, there's only like 10 theaters in the country that can actually <laughs> play it. So uh, yeah, so it's a, uh, now Microsoft, speaking of movies, Microsoft um, stored all the entire Superman movie, on a piece of glass. Why is that important? Well, in theory, Who because cares? it's going to be able to last. Yeah, I mean, right? that's, that's the key. The thing is, of course, that, you know, we used to talk about CDs being such and such, and but it turns out they only last 30 to 40 years before the substrate starts to rot. Mm -hmm. And we've got the same problem with magnetic tapes. Right. You know, you get... And to, drives. And drives, uh, magnetic right. drives. And so we have this problem with storing it. And in theory, because the difference between theory and reality is often quite substantial, this should last for quite a while. In a thousand years, we'll know whether it really lasts for a thousand years. Yeah. You know, like that's the... Remember when you used to buy silver and gold CDs and the silver was the cheap ones that would only last right. two to three years and the gold ones were meant to last 10 to 15 and all that sort of stuff, yeah. Right. I think this is interesting too because there's obviously here in Los Angeles, you know, fires is a huge concern. So, you know, I've bought fireproof uh, cabinets before and I'm like, well, if I'm putting my hard drives in here, that's not going to make that much of a difference. It's fire resistant, but the heat is still going to melt whatever's inside of it. So even having something that's stored in glass, obviously that would melt at a much higher temperature. So I think that's pretty great that it, yeah, it will last way mm. longer. I, yeah, I have a... I, we've had to think about it because the fires didn't get to our house, but you know, they start last year's fires got within a couple miles. And so there's been a lot of discussion about that. And I, and I will say that I, it got me thinking about that, that process of we have a go case, mm. you know, like when I did a lot of travel, there was always a go bag, you know, so you had a go bag that was always all my, everything I needed for that thing. I had to add like three things and I'd be gone. And, and literally when I got home, mm. I would immediately pack that bag. Like I'd wash all my clothes and pack the bag you know, but within hours so that I just was always, always had a bag that was ready to go. And, um, so I built this, this, or uh, I'm in the process of building out this go, this go case that is basically if there's a fire and we have to leave in 15 minutes, you just grab that one thing, you know, like, and it's and a, copy, got of all, a, a copy you know, of all the things, you know, yeah. but, but one of the things for photos, for instance, I'm putting while I'm uploading them to the cloud and making, putting them in two different places, I'm also printing them. You know, on archive photo, yeah. you know, just so I have the fo my most important photos, okay. you know, yeah. in, in that. But I think that all of us have to think about the storage stuff because, you know, I have videos that I no longer have anymore because I, I left them on a, you know, I left them on a CD and then I pulled them out mm -hmm. and yep. they're, not, they're no longer there. And then the CD's dead. I think the interesting part here is too, is I wonder how many people are ready to handle cold data. So people who do video, like I suspect Justine and yourself, mm -hmm. Alex, is that you are used to storing stuff and then saying, I'm done with that, lock it away. I'm finished. Right. But I wonder how many ordinary people would think about this idea of I copy this to this 
thing and that's it. It's written once and I'm done with it. This cold data idea that I'm storing that forever. Well, I think that there's a lot of times when you want cold data, you know, like when we finish it, when, when we work on a show yeah. and a movie is a perfect example, you, mm. you just don't want it to change. Like we've decided that that's it. That's the edit. That's yeah. the edit. And I, it's not like you want all the raw data there, but that final version, mm. you want to have it. I just want that done. Mm -hmm. I just want to put it somewhere, you know, and I think I like the permanency of cutting CDs back in the day <laughs> yeah. um, because it was just like, I knew that if I sent it to a client, it was what it was. It's not like getting changed or moved around or, you know, all those other things. So I don't know. Do you, do you, Justine, do you think you would, you would store on glass? I would love to actually, I'm ready. <laughs> Sign me up <laughs> just mostly for all of my old things. Like I want to have all of that old archived footage. I have still have a lot of it just all backed up on a server. And then I also have the jellyfish server, which is fairly new. So that's most of my recent stuff in the past two years. But even that it's like, you can't trust these drives no matter how many backups of the backups of the backups you have. So if you do have something that is like that, that is way more permanent, like I'm right. definitely into that. And I think a lot of people would be too. Yeah. Yeah. So I think it'll be uh It'll be interesting. So we've got, uh, got a couple things from Apple and Amazon coming up soon, but Leo has one more set of final words for us. Hey, I want to interrupt one more time. I'm going to come back next week and do the show. Thank you, though, for filling in. I really appreciate it. Uh, we, it's, it's nice for me to take a little time off, but I will be back next week. I did want to come and talk about Mint Mobile because I use it and I love it. And it saves me so much money. You know how wireless bills are just ridiculous? If you looked at your bill lately, it's like, it, it seems like it goes up every month. And I know you're paying too much, unless you're using Mint Mobile already. Network coverage is better than ever. It doesn't matter which carrier you use. So why pay more for the same service? Mint Mobile, they're what we call an MVNO. They resell T-Mobile service. So if T-Mobile's great in your neck of the woods, don't pay what am I paying for T-Mobile? 70, 80, 90 bucks a month? Mint Mobile could cut your bill down to 15 bucks a month for the same premium coverage. It's not too good to be true. They save money by not having stores, by doing all the support online. But you get the same great cell phone service. I decided, I'm, I splurged. I got, uh, I'm paying a whole 25 bucks a month <laughs> for my cell phone service. Unlimited text and unlimited talking all over the country. And 12 gigabytes a month, I never go through all of that, but I thought, why not? The trick is I paid all up, up front for a year. So it was $300 for the year, but that's a year of all of that, 25 bucks a month. That's it. 300 bucks a year. You can get it even less, 15 bucks a month with that special three-month introductory plan. You get unlimited nationwide talk. You get unlimited text. You get crazy fast 4G LTE. They just, they reimagined how wireless should work and they pass those savings on to you. You get to port the number over if you want to keep your same number, no problem. And if you're not 100% satisfied, Mint Mobile has you covered. Seven day money back guarantee. I love Mint Mobile. Now you can get literally $15 a month, same exact service you're already getting. It's their three month introductory plan. They'll ship you the SIM for free, put in your existing phone. They have phones for sale, but just go to the website. You can check to see if your phone will work. I'm using my Mint Mobile with a very nice uh, OnePlus 7 Pro. It's fabulous. And it just blows me away that that phone is 25 bucks a month. <laughs> and my uh, my iPhone is 100 bucks a month. When you, <laughs> It just doesn't seem right. I'm moving everything to Mint Mobile. You should too. MintMobile.com slash Twit. Cut your wireless bill to $15 a month with their three-month introductory plan at MintMobile.com slash Twit. M-I-N-T, Mint, Minty Fresh, Mint, MintMobile.com slash Twit. Hey, back to the show, and I'll be back next week. See you then. So Apple has report is reportedly thrilled, thrilled. With the new Apple TV launch, drawing millions of viewers on the deb debut weekend. Uh, Justine, have you watched any of the shows? I've watched a lot, actually. What do you think? And the, the morning show is honestly a really incredible show. I actually got a press screener, so I have seen the whole season, and I can tell you it's amazing. And it's, it's so powerful. Like The performances by Reese and Steve Carell and Jennifer Aniston were just really amazing. It was such an honest show, and it's pretty daring for them to touch on the subjects that they touched on, especially like in this climate. But I think it's a show that needed to be out there. And the reviews 
were not very good for it. And I honestly kind of think that the reason is maybe they were being a little bit too honest and a lot of the people writing those reviews didn't like how honest it was. And um, I don't know, I think it was incredible. Um, there's a couple other shows that are coming out later on that are, uh, I think, very promising. The Truth Be Told, it's like a, um, it's Octavia Spencer and she's she does a crime podcast, which is amazing. So she's going through, um, oh, um, oh my gosh, I'm blanking on his name, um, Aaron Paul from Breaking Bad is mm-hmm. also in it. Nice. It's a great show. Um, they also have the Dickinson show, which is kind of like a CW ish type of show. I haven't watched that one yet. Um, I watched a few episodes of C probably not my favorite, but the morning show by far has it was been so nice. My, I my, loved it. it I haven't great. seen, so I haven't seen C yet, which I was, I was excited about C and for all mankind. Um, and I haven't, the, the, the fundamental problem I had was I was promised this was going to be a family affair. And then as soon as I turned them on, they were all like MA 14, nope. MA whatever. And I'm like, I was shocked. I was ready to I watch it with my it. kids. And yeah. I was like, and I was like all excited to watch them. And then I saw all these MA, MA, MA. And I was like, what the, you know, like, you know, so as I was on the opposite side of that, where I really was excited about finally a platform that is just going to play a bunch of stuff that I can actually watch with my family. That's what I thought too. Yeah. And then even watching see that first episode, I was like, oh my gosh, I hope there's no children watching this episode. But even the morning show, it definitely, I mean, the language and everything yeah. was definitely way more mature, but I, I think it was the helpsters, which is like the, the Sesame street show. I haven't watched mm-hmm. that yet, but there's also another one ghost writer right. when I was growing up. That was one of my favorite shows. So I'm glad to see that kind of get a reboot. But I spent way more time watching Apple TV than I thought I was going to. Yeah, I haven't, um, because of that, the vast majority, you know, as a, as when you have a family, the vast majority of my, my, my viewing habits relate to what we all watch together. So I haven't had as much uh, time to um, to watch to watch through it. My wife tried to watch C, and I think she got through about the first twenty minutes. She said, "I watched ten minutes and I walked away, and then I came back and watched another twenty minutes." And she's like, "Okay, I'm done." So yeah, we- I think we did the same thing. <laughs> <laughs> so, it's just it, I think it we was just do bad because the rumor is they spent like the, the same amount of money. I mean, they spent a lot of money on that film on that show. Yeah, yeah. No, I did start watching For All Mankind, which is a, a cool concept. It's basically like, okay, what if? Russia landed on the moon instead of the U.S., which, I mean, something that I've definitely never thought about, but I think it's a cool concept. I think they also renewed that for the second season. They also renewed C for a second season, which I'm not sure how that's going to go, but whatever. I mean, Jason Momoa is great. Um, And The Morning Show also has a second season. And I think Dickinson as well. The, and it's cool though. A lot of people were complaining about like the price, but if you buy an iPhone, like you're going to get a whole year of this for free or any Apple products. So I think that's, you know, essentially you're getting a free year of the service anyway. Now, are you as excited about Disney plus? I might be a little more excited actually, because <laughs> they are all of my favorite shows. I, I mean, star Wars and Marvel and obviously the whole Disney collection. So I, I can't wait. I'm, I'm very excited. Yeah. And there's going to be way more content as well. Yeah, I think that Disney, you know, is. I will admit that I tweeted some unhappy words about another subscription service that I didn't want to do. But as it got closer, and as you saw it in more detail, you know, as it got closer and closer and closer, like, yeah, I'm probably going to get it. Their, their so, Twitter bomb was was amazing. It did. It did get a lot of a, a lot of. I news. missed this. What was it? It, it was, was they uh, a couple last week or a couple weeks ago. They launched. They basically they tweeted out every single thing that will be on their service in uh, in order of when it was released, each one as a tweet. So Disney Plus did? Yes. So it started, oh started at uh, um, uh, Snow White and then like for, for it took them hours to tweet through every <laughs> single 500 plus things that will be on the show. It was it was it was an amazing event. Yeah. I can't believe I missed this. Oh, you go go back and you can. It's still I was there. probably watching Apple TV, it. which is yeah. <laughs> so, <laughs> so here's, here's, I spent a good few days. <laughs> so here's the question. Here's the question. Uh, and Greg, I'm going to come to you with the same question. But for Justine, eventually we're going to have to make a choice. You know, like well, maybe we don't. I mean, you just spend as much money as you spend on cable, and you end up with all of them, right? But if you're going to choose, let's say five services what are the services that you choose i mean are we talking like music streaming as well because no, I no just you know, just video I, just okay. video um i mean i do watch netflix but i also have five people under my account so i am now responsible for five other people's accounts so i can never get rid of netflix right. uh so 
probably I would say Netflix. And then with Disney Plus, do you also get Hulu, correct? I think Incorrect. I, they have they, they have a a service where you can get uh, Disney Plus, Hulu, and ESPN Plus for I believe fifteen dollars a month. Oh, so it's like a package deal. So I mean, I think that's one of the things where it's you find the best package deal. So I mean, that's pretty interesting because I also mm-hmm. have Hulu. So if I get Disney Plus, I can also package that in. Um, I don't. I I think just a lot of people kind of hop services. They watch a bunch of shows one month on Netflix or for a few months, switch to Hulu, cancel that, and kind of just hop back and forth. I mean, I think that's an option, but I wonder if there's a way to package these things in to give you a better, lower price if you stay longer. I'm not sure. Yeah, well, I mean, I'm not smart enough to package it. Like, I mean, to j- jump in and out. I mean, I, I just yeah. I just have the subscriptions, you know. For me, I, you know, I have my... My, my my wife likes a lot of the competition shows, you know, the, the so you think you can dance and and stuff like that. So we have Hulu mostly to take care of her wanting to watch those shows. I watch for re- for broadcast research primarily. I don't think I pay for it otherwise, but I have YouTube TV because it is the if you're researching broadcasters and you're researching graphics and you're researching stuff like that. For me, being able to DVR just everything, you know, I just go down. I just want to DVR all the shows, and then I go back and I can you know collect them. I don't know. Again, I I don't think I watch enough broadcast TV to justify fifty dollars a month if I didn't do that. Um, Apple TV, I think, is a given for me. Disney is a kind of a given for me. Um, Netflix is. I have a hard time. My my wife's funny. She's like, why are we still paying for Netflix? Like she she, she doesn't. Mm. I don't know when the last time she's watched any Netflix. I think it was. Um, the last Jim Gaffigan, you know, thing was the last time she saw it, you know. Um, but, uh, and then Amazon Prime just comes with your Amazon Prime. So you don't think about that one. That one's kind of like just comes packaged. Yep. And I guess, you know, yeah. I kind of feel like I wonder if Apple's just going to keep on doing that where as long as you keep on buying Apple products, you never actually pay for it. But, yeah. then, they, but then they account for it as a subscription. Because I don't think, even though they're giving us free subscriptions, I don't think that's how it's going to be accounted for. I, I think that they're going to... That's true. They're going to account I mean, for I also it. Have you bought Apple the subscription and you, and you paid less for your phone. What? Go ahead. So it's like I also have Apple Arcade and then Apple News and Apple Music. So at how this do you point, like Apple like Arcade? Apple is, it's cool. I mean, I think it's fun just mostly because you can download the games and you don't have to worry about having a connection, right. which is what you run into with every other game. And they also have so many like in-app purchases. So that free game that you purchased, you've just spent $500 on extra credits. So, you know, having just that subscription base to know that I'm not going to be tricked into having to pay little extras is really great. My kids are, especially my son who's sitting right here is, is a huge fan. Of Apple Arcade, so he's, he's played, Those, it, yeah, played it a lot. It's fun. Has he played Sneaky Sasquatch? Because that's me and my sister's favorite. Oh no, he gave me the no. He hasn't. He hasn't it's, played the Sneaky Sasquatch. It's really fun. Yeah, it's pretty fun. He plays the golf one a lot. What's the golf one? Mm-hmm. What the golf? What the golf? That that one's that one's a very popular one in the in the house. Mostly just I just walk by and I see it. That's that's all I know. Yeah. How about now? How about how about you, Greg? Uh, well, I get Amazon Prime. Right. Just because I don't watch it because there's nothing in it. It's, in the UK, very different packaging and very different right. content, right? Uh, Netflix is almost identical to what it is here. Oh, no, it varies quite substantially. There's a lot of shows that you get here that we don't get mm-hmm. in the UK version. Uh, I get Netflix, but I only get it for my wife and my daughters, not so much for me. Mm-hmm. Um, and then the uh, we get free access to the local TV channels in the UK, which are actually quite good. Mm-hmm. Unlike the US, where a lot of the free-to-air stuff is less than excellent, mm-hmm. shall we say? <laughs> then, and, and so most people feel that paying for s- cable subscriptions or whatever is worthwhile. So that's it. I'm not probably not going to pay for anything else. I wouldn't watch anything that Disney puts out. I'm kind of done with Marvel and superhero movies. I'm, I don't even know if that's even possible for I me. just watched... Uh, I know, I, I love it. <laughs> I found out that the kids hadn't seen X-Men, so we start, we've started down the X-Men path. You know, like, oh, you know, oh, that's like, great. Like, you haven't I just, seen it yet? Like, I thought we saw everything. And they're like, hey, we haven't seen it. And I'm like, yeah, oh. I just did that. So I'm, I'm, not the right, I'm not the right person to ask is what I'm trying to say. I don't get a lot of time to watch TV. I spend a lot of time uh, working and researching and stuff. So, it's, For me, it's travel. Uh, and then family. Yeah, or, exactly. When you know, I, like, when I, like, when I, I remember there was some quarterly report where... Netflix said we're never we don't see any possibility that we're going to download we're going to let people download the videos. I remember that. Yeah, that was yeah, like yeah. 4 or 5 years ago. They were like, "Nope, never going to happen." And now the 90% of what I watch on Netflix is because I download it and I watch it on a plane. Yeah, see, I, I just don't watch video at all. I don't watch no. I do watch occasionally, but it's like if I watched a a video for 2 or 3 hours a week, that would be a big week on TV consumption for me. 
Yeah. I also feel like I have to just to be updated on like what people are talking about. And I right. mean, I love superhero movies. So I, the whole Marvel universe, I mean, having that on Netflix was amazing. Like all of the extra seasons that they do of shows right. like Daredevil. Oh, so great. So like those types of things. I love that it's just expanding that universe and going further into it. So I'm excited for whatever Disney Plus does next. I think that the the number one thing I'm interested in for Disney is Mandalorian. Yes, that's going to be incredible. I'm like, can we just like release all of these at the same time? Because I like that just mass consumption of just doing nothing for a day and making up for it the next day. And <laughs> <laughs> See, it gets us back to when we used to rent. I remember when, when we, I always stayed behind for a, uh, for a long time with like 24 and, you know, we'd watch three or four of them at a time, you know, mm. at, at night. And, and um, it was, in a lot of ways, a lot of times it's, it's much easier to keep track of you know, keep track of what's happening. Like a whole week up, you know, like it's this whole week apart is just this really hard thing to manage now because you're used to just watching all the episodes all one after the other. And so it's, um, I liked it better. I think I I enjoyed Game of Thrones better. Well, I enjoyed better in the early seasons period. But anyway, um, not not that I'm bitter about how it ended. (laughs) Sorry, I didn't, Um, I'm I'm not. You didn't see it. So you don't, you didn't have to deal with the, the uh, horribleness (laughs) of the last season. I'm, I'm, I'm sorry. It's I'm a, a struggle. <laughs> do, you, do you feel the same way, Justine? I mean, so it's weird because I watched a few seasons of Game of Thrones and then I just like stopped watching it. And then I watched like the last, I guess the last season. So I miss. No, oh, you maybe, missed like, the, three the seasons the, in between. So there's the work that we did. Just, the work that we did as viewers for, you know, trying to keep track of all the pieces. <laughs> and, and, and you got to, the worst part was my wife and I got into this thing on the last season because we were so excited about the last season that we were watching between each episode in the last season, we were watching the old ones. So we were watching Game of Thrones like one or two every night, yeah. you know, to get to make sure that we totally understood all the bits and pieces. And I think that made it worse because the yeah, bad writing sure. became <laughs> much, much, it was, it, it was in mm. Technicolor, you know, like, you know, like a, of, of, of what the, uh, of the, um, of how bad it had gotten. Mm. So anyway, but one thing we didn't list, which I think is, partially the fault of that show is HBO. I'm not interested. Are you, are you going to subscribe to HBO? Justine? I, I mean, I think I get it because I actually do still have cable for some reason. Cause it was actually cheaper for me to keep cable than to get rid of cable to keep my internet. So I just kept it. So I think I right, still right. have HBO not as a package. HBO max, but you want, but you're not going to subscribe to the online version for your phone or whatever. I don't, think so. I mean, I think I still actually can have access to it through my phone, but I think HBO Max is something specific. Right, right, right. Yeah. Do you have, is there different content than if I have HBO yes, Go? Yes, yes. There is content mm-hmm. uh, that available to you on HBO Max that will not be available to you on HBO Go, even though you pay the same amount of money. I gotta draw a line, because honestly, like, I don't have time to do all of this watching when it's like, I end up getting into that mode of like, all you want to do is watch content, but there's just so much. So it's like, how do you figure out like, where do you draw the line? And you're talking about YouTube TV, which is actually really great too. I love the DVR feature. That's my favorite part of the whole thing. I mean, that's why Mm -hmm. I have YouTube TV is, um, is specifically because of the DVR feature, you know, that I can, um, like, I'm going to be able to go back and probably watch the Steeler game after this because, um, we missed it because we were doing the show. So, um, so that's a, it's a good, good example. Um, so the, uh, uh, but I think that HBO really is paying a price for how Game of Thrones turned out. Like in this rollout. Yeah. I, I actually think that, that there's a lot of people that are bummed, you know, about that. Wasn't and I think it actually affected, because I know, I know another... right after Game of Thrones, I, I canceled HBO. Like I was just like, wasn't there I'm supposed to be this. like another Game of Thrones show that they there's ended up st- There was three. There were two. There were, were there three? I there's going to be, there's, I think there was three. there's three and one yeah. has been canceled one already. Been canceled. Okay. Um, but the, uh, um, but there's, there's supposed to be, um, uh, there's supposed to be, there, there, there's supposed to be two, two that are still in, in pre, pre-production, I think, but they're still work, trying to work them out. And I think they have to really figure out how to make sure that they come out well. Yeah, um, but the, because I mean, the, that, they ended so badly. And a lot of it had to do with showrunners that didn't, I don't think it would have invested. made too much difference how badly it ended. I think that had an, an impact. But I suspect that the show was so bad that a num- more people quit than would have otherwise. But I suspect a lot of people were only subscribed to HBO for Game of Thrones anyway. Well, I think there's two things there. Yeah. One is is that they should have had three more seasons. Yeah. Because they, they tried to pack three seasons into one. And I think a lot had to do with the showrunners didn't want to do this any longer because they didn't know what they were doing. Yeah. You know, and they, and I think that we, if you watch it, 
uh, you know, there's just the slow trail off since, you know, season five, six, seven, eight, mm. all just slowly fell apart because they just, they didn't think about it that way. They didn't, mm. you know, and um, they're showrunners. They're not, a, you know, Martin, you mm. know, and so, so I think that that was part of the problem. And then the second problem was they didn't have something to come right after it. They didn't have another big show, oh, ready to roll, another yeah. Game of Thrones that was, you know, this is That's something. That's what Avengers that, Endgame felt like to me. I was watching Avengers Endgame in the back of the plane seat because I didn't see it when it came out. Mm -hmm. And I was watching the actors and the actors just all seemed bored. Oh, and I didn't think so. it was just, no, no, I, I was, was watching. I thought it was pretty darn was, good myself. Was, I was like, it was, there was a couple of times when I had to pause because somebody was going through and I was watching and the actors in the back kind of like going, oh, I didn't, you know, I didn't it was like, that. I just was, I found it incredibly tedious by um, about 90 minutes in yeah. going like, really, is it not finished yet? <laughs> I loved it. No? I loved it. Anyway, yeah. so. Uh, I thought it was good. I thought, yeah, it was, yeah, yeah. I, I, I thought it was more than a movie. I thought, it was, I a, thought, I thought well, it was I, and epic. I think that this speaks to uh, Disney's power in this area mm. is that um, MCU was an incredibly well designed oh, yes. system. No, yes, you know, a system of individual video, you know, individual movies mm. as well as group movies, and and you know, I, it'll be interesting to see if they can do that again because yep. they haven't done it very well with Star Wars, in my opinion. I mean, it's mm. it's it's. it's done okay but i think that you know i think that they've had a bunch of missteps in that area so yeah. it's not like the whole company has a model that works it just happened to be that avengers you know they they were able to figure that out and well, I, I think, think that the they, they've been books, able to keep the comic books would going. put characters together and take them apart and put characters together and take them apart so they had a template to work off right. and they could see and so much of the that whole mcu thing is predicated on comic book stories and right. existing you know stories uh you know product that had worked right. and they just had to re-spin it and bring it back. Right. So I think that, and and the audience itself had mm -hmm. um, adapted to that. They were expecting Spider-Man to appear with Iron Man and then right. disappear again, mm -hmm. right? So there was that. But uh, I don't know, Avengers Endgame just felt like it was on entirely predictable train tracks to me and it was just like... Oh, but I love that train. Yeah. It was a great okay. train. You know, it, was it was the closure that we all needed. Yeah, exactly. Exactly. <laughs> See, they ended well. That's yeah. that's the whole thing. They 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 chose well. Not mm. that you know, Game of Thrones chose poorly. I mean, it definitely was very very long. And I watched it. I made a mistake of going to like the 11 p.m. showing. So by the end, I was like, oh, I love this so much, but I'm so tired. So <laughs> right. <laughs> it was. I was like, oh gosh, it's so long. But I mean, it was. It's great. It was something that I think mm. you know, being a fan of the franchise and the characters, I think it gave everybody, you know, like I said, like the closure that, that everyone needed. Mm. Yeah. Absolutely. All right. Well, one last thing um, to make sure that everyone knows, because I think it's important that people um, know that this is available. Uh, Amazon Prime memberships for uh, Veterans Day to celebrate Veterans Day. Amazon Prime is discounting Prime subscriptions for veterans by $40, which I think is a great move. I think that every major company should provide veterans with specific benefits. Um, for their for their service, and so I think it's really important that uh, we make sure that uh, Amazon gets the mm. the uh, kudos from that. Kudos, kudos for that. You know, I think that that's, that's really great. Yeah. yeah. So and uh, anybody else who thinks they can try and get a free ride, don't don't screw it up for everybody else. Yeah, yeah. Don't don't you know if it just requires you to get up and say I'm a veteran or something, don't I think don't it, screw I, it up. Just yeah yeah. But, but definitely, I think that more, com you know, and a lot of companies do. And so I just think it's important that we that we always make sure that it's clear that, that they're they're doing something they don't have to do. And they're mm, yeah. and they're and they're making that available. So um, so anyway, thanks to Amazon for that. Uh, Justine, where can people find you on the Web? Um, I Justine everywhere. So just <laughs> come hang out. <laughs> <laughs> she gets there first. She said that during the show. She registers on all the latest social media platforms and gets there before anybody else. I know, I know. What's yeah. funny is it was over 10 years ago I registered the domain Vlog University and because I wanted to do like a little show just talking about like teaching and instructing people on just making videos. But now 10 years later, we're making an actual conference in Los Angeles. So it's kind of crazy that something 10 years ago that I thought of, it's now like an actual real life thing. So it's, uh, you never know. When is it? Might it's um, January 31st, February 1st at the Los Angeles Convention Center. So it's at vloguniversity.com. Oh, I'm definitely going to check that out. Very cool. You'll Great. have to come teach some lessons because I actually learned Just, from you in the beginning. So, that's how we met. You know, that's how we met. Yes. It so was that'd like, be amazing. Come teach some green screen. Actually, it was funny also because I was at the Final Cut Summit and I was talking to like Mark Spencer and Steve Martin about uh, being in like the motion book. We recorded green screen stuff at your studio years ago. Right. And it's crazy that that all came back around. And I also recently did a Final Cut training with them. So yeah. we released like a whole tutorial. So 
it's a, it's a small world, but it's, it's exciting. <laughs> yeah. That's how, that's how just when, when I was yeah. at, a, I was at an unconference in uh, mm -hmm. Pittsburgh um, and I'm from Pittsburgh. We're both from Pittsburgh. And so, and, and I, uh, but it was, Justine was the smartest person in the class. Like she, was, she was like, <laughs> yeah, you know, she was in the back answering all the, like I was doing a green screen class and yeah. the person that had all the, the right questions, you know, like, <laughs> yeah, like yeah, that, yeah, were, yeah. that was like, obviously thinking about this really hard not mm. like a little and and uh so that's how and then we had to talk afterwards because i was just like okay she really knows what she's talking about so anyway so anyway it was, so it's it was, it's cool to see us all still doing it in in some yeah. sort of way so I'm, it's, it's I'd, amazing i'd happy to come down and talk about as many things as you'd like me to so that just, would be fun i will hit you up Okay, great. Sounds good. Greg, where can people find you on? Uh, you can find me on Twitter as at Ethereal Mind. See what that's it down there on the bottom, right? Yeah, and yeah. Uh, if you're into enterprise IT infrastructure, then we've got a range of podcast channels that you might be interested into. If you're not into enterprise IT infrastructure, probably not your bag at all. So, <laughs> <laughs> so if you want to argue about servers and cloud and most importantly, data networking and uh, things like you want to dive in, snorkel deep, then uh, we're probably the right place for you. Outstanding. All right, everybody. This was a marathon. I thought we could get to three hours, but we didn't quite make it. Oh, I guess we, you know, we'll, but we'll, we could, we could, you could just kind of push it around here. But uh, anyway, thanks for hanging out with us for for so long, and uh, we'll see you. I won't see you all next week, but but someone will because another twit this is in the can. Amazing.